This is Football Focus Weekly with CFI, Charlotte Football Insiders. Starring the pet man, Matt Morrow, owner and founder of CFI. With him, we have Cherie Glenn, our lead reporter, knocking out interviews, going all over the place, just being the queen of CFI. We have Brandon Black, the man behind the camera, the producer, and our photographer does a great shot getting those shots every week. We have with us assistant West Charlotte football coach Brandon Billups. Very energetic young man. Former head coach at Central Bears and East Rowan High Schools, Kenneth McClamrock. One of our big football experts. And then last but certainly not least, we have Josh Kroll. Former Christ the King head coach, former offensive coordinator at multiple schools. And we are Football Focus Weekly. All right. Good evening, everyone. This is the Pep Man, Matt Morrow, Charlotte Football Insiders. You're tuning in to Football Focus Weekly. Big, big show tonight. We got the IMEC to break down the best conference in high school football in North Carolina. And we are going to bring the juice. We're going to bring the energy. Even though the juice man ain't here with us tonight, um, we got to all pitch in, pour a little juice in the cup, and we're going to be ready to go. All right. So we're going to start the show off a little different. We're going to start right and jump right into our first topic. Um, bottom line, are we going to be playing football or are we not going to be playing football? We're going to have a roundtable discussion on it. Um, we had some breaking news a little before the show tonight. The um, Governor Roy Cooper said we're going to be in phase two for five more weeks. Good gracious. I mean, it's tough, man. It's tough. This coronavirus is killing us. But we're going to ask the panel. We're going to go around. We're going to ask. Bottom line, are we going to play football or not here in North Carolina? And we're going to bring the panel in so you guys can see who we got on tonight with us. Um, I'm going to go around and I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves and then we'll let the, the panel kind of talk about the topic at hand. All right. Let's go to the illustrious Coach Billups, the nemesis of the Juice Man. <laughs> I'm illustrious now? Wow. Upgrade. <laughs> Coach Brandon Billups of the greatest high school in the world, baby. I got you. Yeah, y'all messed up. You got my West Charlotte stuff on. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go to Sheree. Um, Sheree Glenn, as always, you know, trying to keep the guys tame. Um, don't know how I'm going to do that, but you know, still glad to be here. Hope you guys are. We are, we are. It's a good day with you, Sheree. Still to Brandon, our producer. Brandon Black, producer slash photographer extraordinaire. Always cool, calm, and collected. He never gets rattled. Never get rattled. Like, like Tom Brady in the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Last but certainly not least, a little controversial, a little emotional, but number one in our hearts, Coach McClamrock. I like it. You know, as most people call me Coach Billups' daddy. So I'm excited <laughs> for tonight. Can't wait to talk to big time football tonight. Let's get it on, Pat, man. The deuce man is not here, so I'm going to try to back it up for him. I got you, deuce man. Woo! Oh, wow. What is, wrong with, what is wrong with the offensive guys? Like, <laughs> Jesus. In our blood, man. It's in our DNA. We don't. I'm to call Baker, man. Baker is like the only offensive coach in, well, I'm a fan. I'm the only two offensive coaches in the world who like me and Jeremy Johnson. My fault. All right, all right. <laughs> so, first off, obviously, we just talked about it. Are we going to have football here in North Carolina in the fall? We're going to have it in the spring, or are we going to have it at all? All right, Coach McClamrock, I'll give you first shot at this. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, with the governor's new proclamation today, we're staying in whatever phase we're in for the next however long we're staying in. it. I just don't see how it's possible. I mean, our superintendent of Cabarrus County Schools said two weeks ago in a board meeting that he does not see a way where sports can be played in Cabarrus County if we're completely 100 uh, percent virtual school. Uh, that said, there are people inside of the county, not necessarily connected to, to the superintendent, who are saying that if the NCHSAA allows it, that Cabarrus County will play sports this year. I just, I just don't see it happen. Then again, I don't see how 
Uh, a county could say no if other counties are saying yes, but then again, there have been counties practicing uh, for weeks now, for, for going on two plus months. They're not throwing footballs. I see you out there, man. That is so disheartening for the guys who can't go out there and throw and run around yet. I'm with you, coach. I'm with you. Um, you know, I've got a lot of opinions to share on this, and I'm going to let the panel keep talking. Uh, let's go to Coach Billups and get his thoughts on this. Um, I, it's gonna be fall. No, not fall. It's gonna be spring. You know, it just it ain't that. When he said what he said, that five weeks, I agree. I think don't keep getting extended, but I think CMS gonna have to come out and just say, well, the state don't come out and just go ahead and say, no, push everything back to fall because everything depends on going to phase three. And I don't think we're gonna go phase three anytime soon, but you know, I agree. You know, I've been very, you know, you know, saying that we're going to play in the spring. I just think that's the best thing. You know, there's going to be a lot of athletes who don't have to make some tough decisions. But, you know, it's going to get the underdog, the seniors who don't have the off, the big time offers right now. It's going to give them a chance to shine. So, like, the people who are going to, like, play SEC or, you know, Ohio State and stuff like that, they're going to be gone. But it's going to give a lot of people the under the radar guys. It's going to be interesting. So, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to. And I know somebody. I know somebody else who's looking forward to it. So hey, it's great points, man. Great points. Um, let's go to Sheree Glenn next on this and get her thoughts. Um, you know, I was always for spring ball anyway, um, just due to you know safety issues and all that. Um, but you know, after looking at you know certain colleges and stuff, you know, who are trying to, you know, not back out necessarily, but, you know, they don't want to play um, for various reasons, obviously. But, you know, one of the big ones is concerns about, you know, COVID-19. Um, I would like to see some sort of football this year, um, but I honestly don't think there's going to be any. Um, I think this is going to be one of those situations where, you know, if you're a senior and you have film or you have opportunities in other areas to try to create film for yourself, then you should probably do so. Um, because the more and more I see it, it's not looking likely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with everything you said there, Sheree. Uh, let's go to uh, Brandon, our producer, and get his thoughts on this. Um, I'm going on, a, I'm jumping on a spring bandwagon. I think we're at least going to give it a go in the spring. Um, I use that phrase simply because obviously they do play. There are going to be some contingencies in place that, you know, if some too many breakouts happen, too many cases, then obviously they'll, they'll probably have to shut it down. But like Billups alluded to, um, if we do play in the spring, a lot of these guys with offers locked down, they're satisfied, especially these power five guys, they'll be gone. So this could actually play in the spring could end up being a blessing in disguise for some guys that would have normally during fall football, maybe been behind some bigger names. You actually have to play them more. So you could see a situation where guys actually get scholarships because we play in the spring because a lot of people that maybe played in front of them will have moved on. So, you know, there's a silver line everywhere. Yeah. You bring up a couple of good points there. That I'm going to expand on a little bit. So, the way I look at it is if you're a player uh, and you, you fit in the certain categories here. So the first one is obviously like uh, Coach Billups said, if you're a, a big power five guy and you're committed, um, why would you want to to risk, you know, playing if we go to the early spring? Um, if you're in the if we're going to play a shortened fall season, then uh, absolutely. You know, just stay where you are um, and, and try to play that out. Or um, because North Carolina, we don't know what's going on. Um, I, I think you, you can, if you really do want to play, just to play it out. You know, this is the time where you look into South Carolina. At least South Carolina has had some kind of plan. Now we've seen them, you know, come out today with, you know, a, a different adjusted, you know, start date to their practice. The official practice date now with pads is September eighth, August seventeenth. Uh, they start going in helmets. Their first game, the first eligible game date is September 25th. 
Um, the thing we've seen consistently with South Carolina is they're looking to find a way to play. Yes, the dates change. Yes, it's annoying. Yes, it's it's frustrating to keep the seat of plan keep changing. But the good thing is they are trying to find a way to play. So if you want to play um, and you're a senior and, you know, you just want to get a few games in before you go to college, then, you know, South Carolina may be the best move for you. Um, looking at the private school situation here, we know that they wanted to, you know, play if we move into phase three. Now, knowing that phase three is delayed at least another five weeks, the NCISAA, the private school um, jurisdiction, is going to have to go back and adjust their plan. So now we kind of have to wait and see what they're going to say. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that it's, it will probably mirror something similar to what South Carolina is doing um, because they've been wanting to find a way to play. But, you know, we got it. We don't know yet. Um, I think, you know, there there were contingency plans put in place for something like this. Um, Q Tucker came out and said, uh, you know, we're going to hear something soon. Very soon was the exact wording she used from the NCHSAA. So I think they had a contingency plan ready to go based on what Governor Cooper said. Um, so it'll be real interesting. And hopefully, you know, we'll start getting some answers here uh, real soon. Uh, we're going to come back to this topic because we've got our first guest ready to go. Um, and I'm sure that's why a lot of you are here to see uh, this talented coach who in his first season won the uh, NCHSAA 4A state championship at Vance High School. So we're going to bring him on here with us. And I'm just going to make sure that we're good to go on that. And um, that's going to be uh, Vance Cougars head coach, Glenn Woodford. And we're going to bring him on right here. How you doing tonight, coach? I'm doing pretty well. How about how are you? Man, man, I'm doing good. I'm doing good, man. We're glad to have you on the show here with us tonight and uh, talk to you a little bit about, you know, what's going on at Vance and, um, you know, how things have really been going uh, ever since, you know, you won the state title and now you got this <laughs> crazy COVID-19 that we're all, you know, trying to deal with. So I'm going to ask you, you know, the first question is, you know, I've been asking some of the coaches that have been on here with us. Number one, should we be practicing? And now with the news today, number two, in your opinion, are we going to be playing football in the fall at all? Or are we going to just end up playing, you know, in the early spring? Um, I think the I think the hope is to play uh, this fall. Um, but the more and more, you know, the you know, COVID keeps going on and we keep getting pushed back, it's looking more and more like the spring. And I think the neighboring states like Virginia, uh, where I come from, they just moved everything back uh, to the spring. So... It's kind of looking towards the spring, but, you know, we all keep in hope that we're playing in uh, the fall. Yeah, I agree with you, Coach. Um, you know, when you've got five weeks more delayed and we're in phase two, um, you know, the fall's looking more bleaker and bleaker here in North Carolina for the NCHSAA at least. Um, so I think that early spring is probably what we're going to end up seeing uh, just to err on the safe side and finally get a clear direction and decisions for everyone involved here. Um so, we, of course, you won the state title last year. We covered a lot of your games, you know, during the season and in the playoffs, uh, so forth and so on. Um, just tell us, you know, what was the ride like? Just incredible in your first season coming in and then just able to, to go and win a state championship. Just what was that experience like? Uh, it felt great, man. Um, it didn't start off. It didn't start off that way. Uh, it took some time. Uh, it took some time to get to know the kids, and it took time for the kids to get to know me. Uh, for me to get to know my coaching staff, for my coaching staff to get to know me. Uh, and once we, you know, once we hit our stride and the kids start buying in, the coaches start buying in, that's when you see a little, you know, a change in, you know, how we played the game and, you know, how we reacted to certain things. And I think, you know, the way that we reacted to certain things and like adversity and things like that kind of pushed us through the playoffs. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just the way that team grew. Um, I, I remember covering the game against Huff when uh, you guys lost that one going into the playoffs. And it seemed like, you know, that game was just kind of the switch that just kind of, you know, lit a fire under you guys. And from there, you just took off throughout the whole playoffs. Um, we're going to bring in um, a good friend of ours and of yours, uh, Mr. Brandon Billups, who's got a question for you. <laughs> What's up, coach? 
So my question for you is, how are you keeping your um, coaching staff active in football right now during this time? Because right now it's tough, you know, as a staff. You want the staff I'm on at the at the Great West Charlotte over there. We, you know, we got to find innovative ways to stay active. And I know your guys, you know, you got my boy Q and Lash and Hackett over there. I know they some personalities over there. But how are you keeping your guys engaged and active in football? And I'm not gonna be skipped today. Um, we actually, man, we haven't. We haven't really, you know, done much football. Uh, we started off. We started off the uh, off season doing some football meetings offensively and defensively. Uh, and then mm-hmm. when the COVID hit, we kind of slowed down. And my focus now was more or less getting to know my coaches uh, and building a relationship with them guys, so they can get to know me and know me how I know how I tick. Um, I know Coach Hack has been talking to his coaches, you know, uh, off and on here and there. But we really, honestly, we really haven't even. Uh, you know, met football wise like that. It's more of a relationship type thing with us now until we can actually get word on what we're doing and then we'll go from there. Good stuff, coach. Good stuff. And those are, uh, you got a really good staff over there uh, with you uh, trying to uh, repeat as uh, state champions. Uh, we're going to bring in uh, coach Kenneth McClamrock here. He's got a question for you as well, coach. Coach, man, congratulations on a on a great season, man. That was big time bringing the, the championship home. I was able to watch the state championship game, and obviously you guys have a lot of talent. I know there's a lot of talent coming back, so you're expecting big things. But I'm going to change up just a little bit, man. With all this uh, change in the name, Zebulon B. Vance, and all that kind of mess, what does that look like with you and your team, man? Is that something that you guys talked about as a team, you guys talked about as a staff? You know, where are the kids with all this? Um, like the kids don't want the name to change. Uh, you know, they've been coming up with things like, you know, just take Zebulon off and just be Vance. I tell you, our kids take a lot of pride uh, in that Vance name. Um, but, you know, obviously it has to change. Uh, so, you know, they had mixed feelings about it. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we talked about it. And football is going to be football. Uh, and we're going to play the game that we, you know, we normally play as Vance. Uh, but it's just going to be a different name. Uh, same mentality, though. Um, and once we figure out, uh, you know, what that name will be, uh, then we'll start to you know build new pride and new uh, you know good new goals and new things like that you know for our school. That's that's really really good, Coach. That was a great question, and um, it's great to hear that um, insight from you and your players about how you feel about you know your name possibly changing because there is a lot of pride that goes into that. Um, we had a lot of players from Vance on our preseason all conference team. Um, just talk about some of those guys and some other guys that you think are going to make an impact, you know, this upcoming season for you. Um, you know, I, I looked at it yesterday. Uh, one thing about my kids, man, uh, since I've been here uh, for the last 11 months, I've never seen my kids actually you know, pay attention to the stats, uh, the accolades and things like that. Uh, my kids pretty much just want to play football. Uh, so, you know, what's important to them is the win loss column. Uh, and that's the way they play the game. You know, they, I don't – you look at Power Eccles. Uh, he had over 50 offers, and social media-wise, you would think he had, what, one or two? And that was because, you know, somebody else put it out there. Uh, that's the unique thing about my kids, man. Um, you know, they love the game of football, and they love everything that comes with it while they're playing. And they can, they block out, you know, the accolades and the outside noise, um, you know, coming from outside the program of somebody telling them how good they can be or, you know, how good they are. And, you know, they show up every day ready to work and earn everything they get. And, you know, we had the saying, getting it out the mud. Uh, and they really, really believe in that. And they really, you know, work hard uh, for everything that they got. So, you know, we pretty much, that's where it comes from, you know, out the mud. So, they, you know, they don't want to get given anything. Uh, so they don't really pay attention to things like that. Uh, you know, and it's, you know, we welcome it, but that's not our main focus. Uh, but, you know, we've seen it. Uh, and some of the kids, you know, you know, are proud, you know, that they've been recognized. But their whole goal is, that 15th week uh and that's what we you know we talk about on a daily coach you're you're exactly right i you know as many games that we've covered with you guys and as many interviews that you guys have been gracious to do it's not something that you guys necessarily seek out you know in the spotlight and the glamour and all of that and i'll tell you you know it, it's refreshing you know in a way because you know that it, it is about the grinding and you're saying about getting it out the mud is really true you guys live it and um, it proved, you know, to be really, really good for you in winning a state title last year, man. 
Uh, Coach, man, this was awesome. I appreciate you coming on and uh, talking with us. And um, hopefully, you know, we'll be out at another practice here at some point, you know, this season or maybe in the early spring, the way it's looking, man. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on tonight, Coach. All right. Appreciate you having me. All right. Thank you, Coach. All right. So that was Coach uh, Glenwood Furby from uh, Vance High School, obviously the state champs. Um, coming on and, you know, sharing some great things about his program, the way they have been operating, uh, the way that they were able to come together and win a state title. Um, just impressive. And, you know, and meeting Coach Ferb last year, you know, the way he is right there is the way he is all the time. He's never too high. He's never too low. Um, you know, obviously the most excited I saw him get was after the state title. But, um, you know, he's always, you know, to the point, matter of fact, um, you know, well-spoken, a strong leader of men. And, um, you know, that came across in that interview we just did with him. Um, so we've got our next guest um, up and ready to go. And uh, we're going to go ahead and, and bring him on because I'm very excited to bring him on. Um, when we first started uh, Charlotte Football Insiders, this was one of the first people we talked to. Uh, we've been, you know, very supportive of him. He's been very supportive of us and our efforts. Um, this program was one of the first ones we highlighted, uh, both myself and Cherie Glenn, you know, uh, have done interviews with, with uh, our next guest. And, you know, I think he has done an awesome job uh, with Hopewell, and we're going to catch up with him right now. And uh, that is Hopewell head coach Jamel Burr, and we're going to bring him in right here as soon as we get the right name up. There we go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> How you doing tonight, coach? What's going on? Man, man, just living the dream over here at CFI, <laughs> trying to, um, you know, bring a little more sunshine in the Charlotte High School football scene. Man, man, you're doing it, man. You're doing a tremendous job. You always have. Just keep doing it. Thank you so much, Coach. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to leave with the first question that we asked Coach Ferb. Um, number one, in your opinion, should we be practicing right now? And then number two, in your opinion, are we going to have football in the fall or is it going to be more like the early spring? I, I think if the, the plan is to play in the fall, yeah, we should be practicing, conditioning, you know, getting ourselves ready for a season because, I mean, you know, as we know, we, the off season preparation and everything that goes into getting ready to play, it's a lot, you know, and getting your body ready and getting your mind ready and getting your offense and defense and special teams ready. Uh, it's a lot and you need the time. Uh, now, if that's the plan to play in the fall, absolutely. But if they're, you know, looking at the spring like it's looking like more and more now, uh, especially with Governor Coopner's decision today, then, um, you know, I just would like to know what the plan is going to be for now until then. Um, you know, what what are we going to be able to do? What can't we do? Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't think we're playing this fall as of right now, just based on the decisions that came out today, I think. Uh, it's looking more bleak and bleak, as you said, you know, with the more that comes out. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, man, that's the most frustrating thing. I know for if it's frustrating for me, I know it's frustrating for you guys as head coaches. I mean, you know, Absolutely. I, I know you you are super organized to the letter. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's and, that, and that's like you said, that's the frustrating part for me, because. You know, like I think most coaches like, you know, you you live by, you know, organizing, structuring, making plans, you know, whether it's football, family, anything. So just that that not knowing uh, and, and not having information for your kids or your families, uh, that's been the toughest part, you know, and not not to sound like, whoa, it's me or anything. But, you know, it's been tough because, you know, of course, I've had different kids reach out to me individually, uh, just worried about, you know, well, coach, what's going to happen with my recruiting? And, you know, what about this? And, you know, even just, you know, parents reaching out and just asking what's going on. And that's probably just been the most frustrating part for me, you know, and same thing with my AD, you know, me and him talk about it all the time. It's just tough when, you know, you're in a leadership position and you don't have answers for things. Well said. Well said. Well said. Um, I, I got to ask, um, what has really been the key – in the success in the rebuilding uh, of Hopewell, because you came in there and you know it was really a tough situation, but now you built it to a point to where honestly now I, I I think you know if we have a full season, which you know if we do or don't, I think you're a playoff team. 
So you yeah. know, what, what has been the key in the success and, and building that thing up from the ground? Uh, I mean, I mean, honestly, it's been a top down, you know, thing. I mean, we, my principal, Tracy Pickard, she's super supportive of, you know, athletics and, and trying to have a better athletic program. I can't say enough about Brian Burke, my AD, a uh, guy that trusted me. You know, you know, I had no head coaching experience. And, you know, luckily he saw enough in me to lead the program. And, you know, just their Uber support alone has been a lot. But, you know, hiring good people, you know, hiring good coaches, having guys like a, like a Lenny Sanders, a Jonathan Grice, a Courtney Gray, you know, Carlos, Arthur Jacobs, all these guys, Doug Miltap, hiring good coaches, you know, trusting them to do their job. Um, you know, I don't know any high school kids that just walk around and just don't want to be good and, you know, they like losing or – or anything like that, you know. I, you know, all I, I tell our kids all the time: you all, you all had greatness in you. You had it. You have it in you. It's just our jobs as coaches to help bring it out of you, you know. And and I think we've done that, you know. So the kids now that they know how to work, they know how to practice, they know how to do these things. Uh, that's been a big part of our success. They, you know, they're policing each other now. You know, the coaches don't have to do as much, and that's been the most rewarding thing, especially this off season before everything got shut down. I thought that our seniors are doing a great job policing the team. We got a lot of seniors and they were doing a phenomenal job policing the team and just taking that leadership role. So, it, you know, it's just been a combination of those things. And our parents, man, we got super supportive parents uh, from day one when I walked in the door. Uh, I'll never forget my first parent meeting. Um, uh, Miss O'Brien, she, you know, he hadn't met me, but, you know, once and, you know, she you know, already was extending her hand to help, like, hey, you know, you need me to set up a contact list for you duh, duh, and just do whatever. So I, I've had a lot of good support around me. And that's something I learned from Bobby, you know, working for him. You know, he always talked about just trying to surround yourself with great people, you know, people that won't let you fail and, and you know, good things can happen. And I feel like we've done a good job of, you know, having good coaches. You know, we got a great admin and, and we got good parents. And, you know, it hasn't been one specific thing. It's just been the support all around, you know. So that, that's been a big part of why we've been successful. Yeah, you mentioned your coaching staff. You know, you got good guys over there. Uh, Coach mm -hmm. Price, um, mm -hmm. you know, very yeah, – it's, it's, yeah. it, it's the toughest thing, especially in CMS now, you know, to, to, to find, you know, good quality coaches just because, you know, the assistant pay isn't – you know, it's you're not getting rich off of it by any means, you know, not even the head coaching pay. So – you know, it, it's it can be tough at times to to try to find a guy, you know, willing to volunteer and put forth so much time to, uh, you know, coaching. And, and in our situation where, you know, you're putting in a little more work because, you know, we're we're rebuilding. We're trying to build something. You know, we're not the established program. So, you know, we're working a little harder and a little longer sometimes just trying to get better. Uh, and I've been fortunate and I just had good relationships, you know, with guys over the years. Um, you know, Lenny Sanders, who I've known since I was at Harden, you know, Doug Mailtap, we go back to, you know, we're both West Met guys. And, you know, Coach Grice is the guy I met at a Glazer clinic. We just struck up a conversation, um, you know, after a Glazer session that uh, Jarvis was speaking in and he was just a guy I kept in touch with. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to, you know, that he took a job, uh, you know, with me and helping me. Uh, and, and Arthur Jacobs, another guy I met at West Met and, you know, just, having good relationships with really good guys. And, you know, and I, I I feel like, you know, as a head coach, if I can just, you know, trust them guys to do what, you know, it is they're supposed to do and I can go handle, you know, the head coach stuff that's non-coaching that, you know, I, I hate to do sometimes, but, you know, it's it's my job as a head coach. And I'm, I'm good. I'm always going to be good. And, and I trust those guys do their job. I'm never going to, you know, micromanage them or stand over them like, you know, if I see something, you know, I, I'll maybe I'll, I'll tell them, you know, after practice or in a closed meeting. But I trust them to do their job and, and they've all haven't proven me wrong. You know, so I feel good about that, too. Excellent. Yeah. Well said. And you're right. You definitely don't coach for the money in CMS. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. And that's what just makes it tough to find quality guys, man, because, you know, you, you're putting so much time for, you know, driving back and forth, depending on where you live at in the city and, you know, it's like, you know, end of the season, if you're assistant, it's like, hey, here you go. You know, it's like you know, basically just a gas stipend at that point. You know what I mean? So, you know, that that's why, you know, I'm I'm very thankful. I found really good assistant coaches. Well said, Coach. Well said. 
All right, so I'm gonna bring on a familiar face here. Then she's got a question, <laughs> and she gives it away. So here is Sheree Glenn. Um, so <laughs> I know that you know dealing with a football team during a pandemic is already crazy enough. But um, out of that, um, what's one of the biggest fears that you have coming into this season? Biggest fear coming in this season. Uh, you know, just just feeling underprepared, you know, um, not having that normal time frame that we do things and, you know, how we had the off season and we had a summer and then you have, you know, fall practice or fall camp, you know, just feeling underprepared and just, you know, having to adjust on the fly, you know, because, uh, you know, we're still a program that's building, you know, we're not a program that's established. So, I think it's more important that, you know, we be intentional about, you know, planning and, you know, how we're going to do things, when we're going to do them and those things, you know, not us not having a plan is not, you know, great for helping us to continue to grow and build. You know, I think if you're a Mallet Creek, if you know you're a Catholic, a Weddington, a Huff, a Vance, you know, it, it's probably a little easier because, you know, they're established, you know, they, they are who they are. You know, it's probably a little easier for them to adjust on the fly. So, that's probably just been the biggest fear for me, just just feeling underprepared, you know, um, you know, myself, the coaches, the kids, everybody, just that underprepared feeling because we don't know what's going to happen and how this thing is going to play out. Yeah, man, being in the boat, um, one of the things I've been saying is there's no playbook for this. No, um, you know, <laughs> none, none of us have been through a pandemic. You know, the last one was what, 1918, that <laughs> Coach Bill threw on a couple weeks ago on the show. And um, yeah, we don't want none of us around back then. So, yeah, we don't. <laughs> yeah and, so, and, and, and that's and that's kind of the other like positive of it. You know, like I, I try to tell the kids and the parents and, and the coaches, everybody, like at the end of the day, we're all in the same boat. You know, what I mean, it's not like this is going on here and it's not going on at, you know, Vance or Huff or Mallet Creek or Myers Park, wherever. So we're all dealing with this uh, brand new thing in real time, you know, together. So that's kind of the other thing that, you know, helps me stay a little more uh, sane, you know, like everybody's, you know, struggling and dealing with adjusting on the fly and how we're going to do this and what's going to happen. So that's been the other thing that helps keep me, you know, grounded per se. Well said, man. Well said. Uh, mentioning Coach Billups, we're going to bring him on because he's got a question for you. Always a pleasure. My guy, Bert. Always a pleasure. What's oh, going on? Pleasure. How you doing, Bert? I'm first good, off, man. How are you? Man, bless and heart, baby. You know what I do. Good. Um, first thing, I want to say, you know, I love what y'all guys are doing over there. You know, I'm one of the few people who actually been at Hopewell. I was there with no. Brown with his first year. And I saw the plan, and when you got that job, I told him, I said, hey, I'm going to let him get it. You know, it, they need a whole new restart. I said, because it, it needed to get blown up, and I was glad, and I love what you guys are doing, and I'm a big fan. And my question to you is, it's the same question I asked Fergie. How mm -hmm. are you keeping your staff active in football right now, like keeping them engaged? And what are you doing? Not like, you know, because – you know, it's uncertain when we don't be out there. So what are you doing? Uh, you know, the, the biggest thing is, you know, like like a lot of people, I'm sure we did the same thing like a lot of people when the pandemic hit. You know, we were having Zoom meetings, you know, with the kids regularly. You know, coaches, we hopped on a Zoom a few times. Uh, you know, that's died out a little bit because, you know, like my big thing, you know, I didn't I didn't want to Zoom them to death. You know, I know being on Zoom every single day and, you know, or just it's going to wear on a kid after a while. And so we've kind of we've cut back on that a lot. And lately, you know, it's been just been more individual phone calls to the players. Like I, I've been big on, you know, FaceTiming guys and just, you know, checking on them every so often. Uh, coaching wise, man, you know, we all talk like that. That's the great thing about us. Like we all talk, whether they're in a group chat or, um, you know, we talk on the phone regularly. Like I saw the coach Sanders on the phone regularly, coach Grice, you know, coach Sanders, coach Jacobs. Like I, I literally, we all talk on the phone, you know, on a regular basis, whether it's once a week, you know, sometimes multiple times a week. So we're all in constant communication, man. And, you know, football wise, we, we did majority of it, you know, in the first front end of the pandemic, you know, with our meetings, we were doing, you know, Position meetings, we were doing offensive defensive meetings, we were doing team meetings. 
So football, you know, we feel like is is pretty much done for the most part. You know, once we be able to get started, that'll be the good thing because then we'll be able to get to, you know, put plan of action the things that we installed. And, you know, because we got all new, all same starters, we didn't really change a whole lot. Like, you know, our, our big thing has just been fine tuning and maybe changing some things or doing some things better. But uh, we just stay in constant communication, you know, on the phone, through the group chat. Like, you know, we're we're pretty tight knit guys, you know, so I, I haven't gone too long without hearing from, um, you know, any of my coaches, you know, maybe a week at most, but we stay in constant contact. Good stuff, coach. Good stuff. Um, we're going to bring in um, former head coach, Ken Clamrock. He's got a yes, question. Sir. Well, coach. What's up, coach? What's going on, coach? Man, I'll tell you what, you know, it was it was so exciting this year. Uh, Coach Burr and I, we got to throw a little bit this summer. You know, yes, it was sir. exciting to see, especially after a really rough first game, man. You guys kind of turned it around and you guys yeah. are trusting in the process and all that stuff, man. I love the positivity that I see uh, you guys put out on Twitter, man. Uh, I've got a question for you, though. A couple of things that's been mentioned even tonight. So you mentioned how, you know, you're still a young coach, man. I think this is your third year coming up. Pat mentioned yes, how organized you are. I think he said to the letter, all that kind of <laughs> stuff. You know, my question to you is a little bit different. You know, through all this pandemic and you have a plan A, and then you kind of move to plan B, then you kind of move to plan C, and then you have a plan, what the heck are we going to do? Man, you know, I know in years, if you're like me, I imagine I knew where I wanted to be at the end of May when spring practice ended. I knew where mm -hmm. I wanted to be the first week of the summer, the second week of the summer, by the last week of July. You know, who the heck, man, who are you going to for advice? Who are some of your mentors that you're going to that you can figure out what the heck? Because we are so thrown off. We didn't have spring ball. We didn't have summer ball. Like when we finally start up, if we start up on September, the whatever they're saying now, like where should we be? Like, like what should that look like? How much is too much? Should I, should I throw the kitchen yeah. sink at them? Should I really scale it back? We had all this momentum going. Who do, who do you go to, coach, for advice, man? Who's your go to? Uh, you know, you know, Nick, Nick Mata has been my guy a lot. Nick, I don't know, you, you know, Nick Mata was the head coach at West Meg. We talked quite, quite a bit. You know, we both were young head coaches, you know, came up at the same time. Uh, I, you know, we, we talk a lot, bounce ideas off each other. Uh, I occasionally get, you know, a text from, um, uh, my, my mentor, of course, and a call, like he calls me pretty regularly, you know, Bobby Collins. I, I talked to him still, uh, you know, my, my queen city bowl, uh, coaches group chat we talk every so often so you know um that, that's been the cool thing like you know just being a young guy and and uh all these you know legendary coaches I would say you know in the city and in this area uh I've been fortunate to be able to have some relationships with them um you know coach Hills man he's he's one of my favorite people like that that I've probably met through all this this head coaching thing and you know um I have so much respect for him and he's always uh you know, if I shoot him a text, like he always texts right back or something. Uh, Coach Jenkins, man, Coach Jenkins, too. Um, if I ask him for anything, he's always great about hitting me right back. And, you know, I'm like, Coach, can I, you know, can you help me with this, do this? And he's always been great. So uh, I'm fortunate for that. But my go-to guy is probably Nick Mata. And, and, it, and it's tough right now because, you know, he's in South Carolina and they're getting to do stuff. So, um, you know, when he calls me and tells me, about, hey, man, this is what happened at practice today, you know, it's a little – you know, a little bit of me is like, ah, oh, man, I don't want to hear about that. Like, you know, <laughs> we ain't getting to do nothing. So those are my go-to guys that I kind of lean on. It's good stuff, Coach. That's a very impressive list, Coach, as you mentioned right there. Um, <laughs> you mentioned the uh, Queen City Senior Bowl. I asked Coach Hales about it last week. Yes, what experience? Like, I'm going to ask you the same thing. What was that experience like for you uh, being the B coordinator of the winning team there? Man, man, you know, the, the, the funnest part was just, you know, being a head coach, something that, um, you know, I, I forgot how fun it was just to be able to coach. You know, you're not worried about, you know, budgets, booster club meetings, you know, setting the practice schedule, nothing like, you know, you just I literally just got to show up every day and coach and, you know, and, and be a linebacker coach and be a defensive coordinator. And that was so much fun. And like you said, uh, like Hale, Coach Hale said as well. Being around those, those coaches, man, like just seeing how everybody kind of brought a little piece of them to that team, that was great to see as well. You know, from, um, from Coach Thompson over at Olympic, 
you know, Coach uh, Washington at Charter, you know, Coach Hales, Coach Jenkins, Coach Gray. Coach Gray is phenomenal, man. Me and him, we uh, we 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 had a lot of fun on defense. You know, he was coaching defensive line. I was I was coaching the linebacker, so we had a lot of fun uh, in inside and things. And man, it was just a illustrious group of guys, man. And and Coach Hales, man, he's so top notch. Like, you know, from the first meeting we had as a staff, you know, he had the practice script for the week and you know, everything we were going to do, and he was highly organized. I mean, it's no secret to see why he's been as successful as he has. So it was just really fun, man, to just be a coach for a change and be around that level of talent of guys, just so many good guys, man. Like, it, you know, uh, one guy I bragged on constantly throughout all was uh, Lutzel from South Lake Christian, the kid that had like 16 picks. Kid was so smart, man. Like, I, I haven't met many guys in the secondary just that smart, I mean, me and Coach Jenkins even made jokes like, you know, it, it's going to be tough to take him out because he, he was making all the checks on the back end and getting us lined up and things. So, you know, it was just so fun to be around so many talented players, man, like and just having fun and just coaching. Like, you know, we're not worried about anything. We're just out here for two hours. We're, we're having fun. We're playing football. We're not worried about nothing else. And, like, you know, like Coach Hill said, to be a part of the first, you know, because – to be honest, when I got, you know, the the call that, you know, or the email that they wanted me to be part of it, uh, I was very, very, very surprised. And, you know, I was very humble and and I wanted to take this opportunity very serious because, you know, I knew how big of an opportunity it was. So, you know, I was just fortunate uh, to get the opportunity and that Coach Hills trusted me with the defense enough to say, hey, man, you're going to run the defense. And, you know, luckily we came out on the right side of it. I, I felt like we'd be good, be all right. Like I felt prepared and, you know, I didn't go into that game Saturday feeling uptight. It was probably, you know, more just, you know, I just wanted us to show what we've been doing all week because I felt like we would be all right. But it was just fun just to, just to coach, man, for a change and not have to worry about anything else and just share camaraderie with those coaches and just have fun. Good stuff, man. Good stuff and great memories. Great I memories. I, I go back and look at the, the the film. The you know I look at the practice film more than anything else. That that was that was the cool part of it because you know we don't really get to do that very much and you know just to see the real coaching going on and um, just just it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun all week. Um, Coach, you got you know some players on our IMAC preseason all conference team: uh, Julian Gray, Jacob Polite, sure, Williams. Um, Fred Bates. Uh, talk about those guys and some other guys that you feel like are going to make an impact for you. Uh, well, you, you, know, you know, Julian Gray, enough can't be said about him. You know, over a thousand yards, you know, over 50, 50 catches last year. Uh, I mean, he's he's a special guy. And, and I remember, you know, when we came in at first staff, we identified him as a guy that we thought could end up being a very special player. And, you know, we're glad that it's worked out because we we seen that talent in him early on. Jacob Polite is a guy that, you know, he's a he he was a guy that was, you know, he's a basketball player. And, you know, we, you know, we we kind of laid on him a little bit, got him to come try football and help him understand, like, hey man, it's a premium for six three guys in a in a sport like football, you know, not as much as, you know, like it is in basketball. But he was primarily a basketball guy most of his life. Uh started playing receiver fours, and now he really loves it. Like he really loves this game of football and playing receiver. Uh, he's working his tail off to be better. Was having easily the best, one of the best off seasons of anybody on our team, and he's still working to this day. I, as a matter of fact, I just I got off the phone with him not too long before we got on here, uh, just you know, just checking in with him. And uh, he he's a super special guy, man. He's a classic ex receiver, you know that that guy you put on the backside, put on the island, and, and kind of let him you know do his thing in those one on one situations. And he had some really good games against some of that top talent. Like, I think he had a pretty decent game against Mark Lowry, you know, had a decent game against Huff. You know, the teams, you know, we felt like had the two best secondaries in the conference. So uh, I'm excited to see what he's going to do this year. Defensively, Fred, Fred Bates, man, he's really developed into that leadership role on defense, being that free, he plays free safety for us, uh, makes all the checks on the back end, gets the helps, gets the lined up. And he really has embraced the leadership this offseason, especially during the pandemic. Uh, him and, and our quarterback, DJ Mosby, are like the, you know, the, the the point guys or the contact guys for, you know, I, I heard that they're, they're the guys that kind of help get guys together and they go over stuff. You know, they know they hop on Zoom calls and all kind of stuff together. So it's been cool to hear that stuff out of him. You know, Chris Williams is a guy, 
He's a he's been a, a solid producer in the conf, in the conference. You know, he's a guy. He doesn't talk a whole lot, doesn't say a whole lot, but he produces, man. Like he's had two really solid seasons this past year. You know, stats just just up there with the other great linebackers in the conference. Uh, some guys that, like you said, weren't on the list. Uh, Jabari Brown's a guy I have to talk about. You know, Jabari Brown plays overhang safety for us, plays what we call the star. You know, he's played in pretty much every position in the secondary, uh, but plays a super important role because his role is probably the most versatile. Uh, I mean, we're looking for a big season out of him. He's been working his tail off in the weight room, probably gained about 10 pounds in all season, just, you know, putting on the good weight. Uh, Trey Ron Richardson is another one, you know, real quiet guy, doesn't say a whole lot, but, you know, he's been really good for us playing our rover safety. Uh, missed a lot of the season last year, had had some off the field issues and ended up missing a big part of the season. But uh, he's back, man, and we're so happy to have him back. Uh, a guy that a lot of people don't talk about, man, and maybe it's because he's, you know, an undersized guy, but Major Weathers, man, one of my corners. Uh, Major Weathers has started every single game on varsity since he's been at Hopewell my first year. He was a guy that we got, you know, late in the summer. Uh, you know, we were playing him in some other spots. You know, we tried him at corner a little bit, and, you know, he he really ran away with that spot. Like, he proved that he was the best guy there. And even in his first game, he had a really good game. And, and in his second game against Independence, uh, he had to pick that game, and, you know, they kept trying to throw the fade ball at him, and then he eventually picked it off. Uh, and he ended up going on having two more picks the rest of that season. And he started every game, and and I think he's a guy that didn't get a whole lot of you know hype and pub, you know, because he's undersized. You know, he's he's not he's not your your six foot corner and all that. But man, just an absolute uh, a baller, and just plays plays the game the way it's supposed to be played. Uh, another guy, Michael Miles, man, Michael Miles uh, plays linebacker for us, and he's a guy that had to play a little bit of linebacker, a little bit of overhang safety for us. Another quiet guy, doesn't say a whole lot. His last four games of the season were some of the best games defensively of anybody on our defense. And uh, we were really excited about him being in a major, you know, starter role this year. Uh, an another group I have to give credit to is our offensive line uh, because Coach Gray has done a phenomenal job with our offensive line. You know, we had guys that have never really played the position starting for us this year. We had one guy that was a returning starter. And he's done a phenomenal job. And I think that was probably the most uh, consistent group on the team as far as the position goes. And all those guys were brand new starters. And, and of course, game one was really rough, like Coach McLaren-Rock mentioned. You know, but when you're going against a guy like Tavi Dunlap and Rudy and, you know, and Baruti and those type of guys, it can be rough on you as a first-time starter. But, you know, the consistency those guys played with down the stretch was, was phenomenal. Um, and my quarterback, DJ Mosby, man, you know, quarterback, running back, receiver, DV, everything. But him taking over that quarterback role for us is going to be big. Uh, he, he probably knows the offense, you know, better than most people on the team. You know, some maybe better than Coach Grice. <laughs> but uh, I'm so excited for what to see him to play quarterback and be the starter because, you know, he played quarterback before. You know, when he came to us from East Gaston, he had already played. He played quarterback, you know, and then we end up playing him at, you know, receiver and running back and some other things because he um, because he, you know, he, we, we needed to play him there because, you know, we had A.J., so we didn't want to waste him just being a backup. And, and he has the ability to play some other spots. Um, uh, shoot. I had one more guy. Oh, Gronk, man. Uh, big Matt Flanders, my tight end. You know, he's he'll be a junior. Uh, 6'4", 6'3", 230, 240 cat, uh, real quiet cat. But, man, he's been working his tail off, too. He'll be tremendous. Uh, play fullback for us, play tight end, play splits out wide, does a lot for us. Uh, he's drawn a lot of, you know, G5, power five inches because his size, obviously. And he's putting together good film. Um, and, and another guy a lot of people, I think, don't talk about, uh, Dom O'Brien, man. Dom O'Brien is our long snapper, plays outside linebacker for us, plays some DN, and I'm just giving him some pub, man, because he he he's the you know the epitome of what you want uh, as a coach. Like you know he you ask him to do anything, he's gonna do it. Like we needed a long snapper, and 
Dom literally just like, hey, coach, like, I I'll do it. And, you know, he started trying to teach himself a little bit, and his dad started trying to help him. And uh, it was just crazy because now, like, you know, they're going to all the long snapping camps, and, like, he's really good. And I watched these videos of him snapping in the net, and it's just been, like, crazy to see uh, how just him trying something has – you know, spawned to him to being really good at it. So, um, I mean, I, I, of course, I could sit here and name guys all day. But, you know, I, I just, you know, I want people to know, man, we got really good kids. And, you know, all of them deserve some love, man, because they, they work hard. You know, like I'm sure everybody does. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, people don't hear about our guys. And, you know, of course, everybody hears about Julian. And, you know, we love Julian. Julian knows I love him. But, you know, we want people also to know about our other kids and not just number eight, you know. Yeah, there was a, a lot of talent that, that you mentioned right there, Coach. And I'm glad you mentioned the long snapper. We didn't – out of all the positions we had in the IMAC, we didn't have a long snapper. But when we looked, you know, at, at um, O'Brien, uh, he, he definitely, you know, can, can get it done, you know, from that position. Yes, sir. Um, you know, Coach, you know, it was a pleasure talking with you, man. I'm glad we were able to get you on here tonight. And uh, you able to share it. Yeah, yeah, we definitely appreciate you, man. You were able to share a lot of good stuff about what's going on uh, up at Hopewell. And, you know, hopefully we'll be out of the practice in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, hopefully, man. Like, you know, just – I mean, like I said, man, just just give us something. Just let us know what's going on. So at least that way, you know, we can we can kind of wrap our heads around what's about to happen here because – you know, it's 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 just been getting tougher day by the day. Like like I told my coaches and some of the players, you know, it's getting a little tougher and tougher to keep, you know, wait, you know, making use of your time every day, just trying to find stuff to do. You know, the COVID projects are running out. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't lying on that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but um coach man, it's a pleasure having you on, man. Thanks for coming on and we hope to, to see you in person again real soon. All right, so that was um, Hopewell head coach Jamel Bird, you know, coming on, sharing a lot of good things about what's going on at Hopewell, uh, rebuilding that program literally from the ground up, like we mentioned. Um, I, and I think if we do have a, a season um, full or reduced, um, I think they're at the point now where they can, you know, go ahead and, and make the playoffs. All right, so now it is time for everyone's favorite segment on CFI, Football Focus Weekly, because it is the only segment that we have. <laughs> it is called Sound Off. And we are going to bring the energy on Sound Off. I always let the panel go first. And usually we lead with the Juice Man, but the Juice Man is out of town on work. So we're going to go with the number two hitter, and that's Coach Billups. And we expect him to bring energy on Sound Off because that's what he does best. Here we go. Oh man, I could—I don't even got that much energy to listen to Bird talk about my guys, man. Them some good kids. Hey, but um, my sign off probably is, and you know, Pep told me not to say nothing, but I'm—I'm going to say it because I—that's who I am. You get tired of y'all and y'all opinions about these darn lists. It's just a list. It's an opinion. It's an opinion-based list. You can't get mad at Pep. For saying, hey, these are the top guys. That's basically what a preseason list is. When even when the observer doing, they don't mean that we don't think your son or you are that that top person in that conference. It's just a perspective. You know, you gotta respect everybody's perspective. You know, you know what all Mac does for the community. You always just feel, you know, just be glad that somebody taking time for free <laughs> to make. You may, you know, have an outlet for these kids and just put them on a spotlight. Like, you just get so much stuff, so many different opinions, like, you know, slandering in time. You just get tired of it. Like, I had to step in and help them out and make sure we didn't miss nobody. You know, I was watching film while I was at work. And then I called them. Then a phone call dropped. <laughs> I had to start texting them. And it was just, you know, I, I, I'll get Pep to shut off my back because – he always been that guy who will do whatever he can for the guys. And that's the only reason why I do the show. He knows 
pep you know, a lot of people know I'm a very proud person. I like to I'm just a hobby sometimes. But you have to just appreciate the man for for doing that. And when he misses a kid, he give him a shout out. You know, we all we all do so much just so we can make sure that every kid gets spotlight, but we don't miss it because a lot of guys and we as coaches, we gotta do better than this. We gotta make sure our guys have Twitter account, but it can't be OG killer, um, all about this smoke, um, pop shop and drop, you know, these IG and these Twitter names. I don't wanna talk to OG killer Kush. You know, I I'm I'm nervous now. But um be professional, you know. We all got to do better, but y'all, y'all, st- y'all get off my boy Pep. You know, Pep, Pep busts his butt, and you know he's one of the best guys in this area. So you know, give him a little, give him a little slack. Coach, thank you for those kind words. Um, you know, I'll I'll respond to that later. All right, but <laughs> I, I, had to, I had to let him know because they don't me and you legit was. <laughs> Hey, what's this kid? You, hey, you, I was helping you. Watch, it, just, it was a lot. It was a lot of work that went into it. It was a lot, man. Um, but that's that's how we do things at CFI. We just oh, don't yeah. you know, throw names up that are easy to find on a 247 recruiting ranking list. Um, but Uh-oh. I'm not talking about nobody. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> Uh-oh. Yes, you are. Uh, all right. All right. Me Coach Phillips like on around the horn. All right. <laughs> go to Sheree Glenn, and she's going to go ahead and sound off. Let's go. What you got? Oh, there we go. Well, um, recently decided to put a group together, um, I guess kind of a unity group to um, hold schools accountable for, you know, how they're being treated as far as, like, are they safe with COVID, you know, um, conditions or, you know, is it a social injustice that's going on, um, you know, with their schools that they need to, you know, address. Um, and then the Big Ten, I guess, recently, I guess a couple of days ago, um, decided to follow suit. Um, and I just think it's really cool to see these guys and how they're responding to everything. Um, and it kind of just l- tells you how 2020 is going to be. Um, and has been for the last, what, seven months, eight months so far, Um, you know, just from the protesting to, um, you know, just these kids standing up for their rights as college athletes and students. um, I just think it's something that's really cool to see. So shout those guys out. Well said, Cherie. Well said. I totally agree with you on that. All right. We're going to go to the uh, producer extraordinaire, Mr. Brandon Black, and we're going to let him sound off in a positive manner because that's all he does. You know, I, I try to keep it that way. Um, I'm going to stick with football, but, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. And uh, just a story I'm going to keep my ear to and see how it goes. Um, earlier this week it came out that uh, Mr. Dwayne Johnson, a.k.a. The Rock, had bought the XFL or what's left of it anyway, I should say. And, um, Looking at the money they spent, you know, all total, $15 million, um, I think it's a very low-risk investment. Um, the upside is there, though. I think if they can get the brand going, sort of position it as, you know, almost like a developmental league for some of these guys that maybe were on the bubble as far as uh, NFL prospects coming out of college or even some guys that maybe fell out of the light in the NFL and are trying to, you know, regroup and get back in the league, it'll be a perfect landing spot for them. So if they can work in tandem with the NFL, sort of uh, be a bridge for certain guys to get in the league or even getting back in the league, I think um, I think it, it could prove to be, a, you know, a positive thing. And, you know, it'll give us some, uh, hopefully, you know, after all this COVID is behind us, it'll give us some, some football in the spring, you know, on an annual basis. So, you know, I'm kind of curious to see, what they do or how that goes from here yeah you know i I did see that that's a that's a good point man the rock you know buying into that um you know keep hearing the xfl is going to be dead but then now we see this happening um you know if you're watching this show you probably feel like us the more football the better so you know totally agree excited to see what does come of that and if it does lead to a great video football game that has real um real football stuff going on not like madden 
I know Coach Bills will agree with me like that. It would be a very good thing. All right, <laughs> we're going to bring in Coach McClamrock, and we're going to let him sound off, and he always has the energy and the great messages in his sound offs. Coach, what you right, got? Man, man, I'll tell you what is so frustrating right now is we have schools in this state who have been working out together as a team for five, six weeks, however long it's been. And then we've got so many schools in this state who can't even get together with one another. When is this going to end? I mean, at some point, we got to make a decision, man. Not only do we have guys that have been working out for five or six weeks, but now I'm seeing all these posts on social media about teams throwing footballs together. And, oh, man, it's so great to be out here. And all we want to do is play. And, man, look how awesome we are. No, man, I want to – let's talk about the kids who can't even get out there yet. The kids who can't even be together with their boys, the coaches who can't look out for their players, the coaches who can't tell their players that they love them in person and put their arm around them, man. Like, come on now. Now, we have gone for weeks and weeks and weeks and no spring ball and no summer ball, and we're going to wait until next week, and then we're going to wait until the next week, and that week comes. Well, never mind. We're going to wait until – three weeks from now, and now the governor is saying we got to wait five more weeks before we get into whatever plan it is that we're going to be in phase out. Is it phase one, phase two, phase two plus one minus three C, whatever the heck it is, like make a decision. North Carolina High School Athletic Association, it's time to make a decision. Either we're going to play in this, the, the fall and it's time to get rolling or else we're not. But quit tagging, quit, quit dragging people along. Man, kids, they need to know. There is no teacher in the state of North Carolina who shows up in the classroom and the kids say, what are we doing today? And she goes, oh, I don't know. Let's figure it out after the bell rings. Like, you got to have a plan. What's the plan? What is our plan? Are we going to play in the fall time? Are we going to play in the winter time? Are we going to play in January? Are we going to play in the springtime? Are we going to condense uh, all three seasons into shorter periods and go past uh, uh, the middle of June, you know, there was a time when softball state championships happened after school got out. Well, we got to know something here, man. Coaches need to know. Coaches, parents need to know. Uh, we got to make a decision, man. It's, it's so disheartening. I can't even imagine what coaches and players are going through. I can a little bit because I talk to them, how frustrated they are. And, man, it's like everybody keeps passing off the buck to everybody else. Well, we're waiting on the governor to make his decision. Well, why? Let's you make a decision. Governor uh, Roy Cooper, let's make a decision. Q Tucker, it's time to make a decision. Individual LEAs, it's time to make a decision. Like if we were still using hashtag, man, it would be a hashtag, make a freaking decision, and let's go, man. It's time. We got we got to make a decision. Their kids have been waiting for too long, man. Let's go. Man, I, I thought I would, you know, come correct and bring all the juice and energy, man. I, I feel like I was in one of them old school church sermons just now. Man. I'm not. I'm not even. I haven't even gotten started yet. My <laughs> wife and boys are looking at me like, "Why in the world are you screaming so?" They they know the answer why I'm screaming so loud because it's who I am. But we got to make a decision, man. Come on, like it's time. It's time. It's stinking August the fifth. Every single person on Facebook and social media are getting all these memories, man, all these great memories from years in the past. It's not fair. It's not fair to our kids. It's not fair. Yes, make a freaking decision. People who know me, they know it. Make a freaking decision, man. It's not right. It's not right. We're not doing right by the kids. We're not doing right by the coaches. We're not doing right by our communities. Man, let's think about how great football is for the communities of our schools. I mean, we've got entire communities that shut down. It may not necessarily be like that in your bigger, more urban areas, but in smaller communities, like, like the communities that are out there practicing right now, like football, football shuts down the town on a Friday night, man. It's what brings people together. And either we're gonna have it or we're not, but make a decision so that we can move on and we can start planning for the future. Make a freaking decision. Hashtag, man, I'm out of here, Pep. Man. Bro, I don't know how I'm going to follow that up. 
<laughs> you know, I, I, you know, when we, I, I'm gonna go back to the the conference list um, that Coach Billups referenced and the things that he said earlier. There were some really nice comments. I didn't post all of them, um, but uh, I do want to say thank you uh, to all the kids that sent messages. Um, you know, and they they you know retweeted you know the list out. Um, we we do this with a lot of passion here at Charlotte Football Insiders. Um, I, I will get a little personal about how we do things. Um, we do not make any money um, doing this. I haven't asked for one cent. I think out of all the years that we've covered um, high school football, I got paid maybe three times, and two of them were with CFI covering uh, camps. Um, you know, it, this is a passion project. Everyone that works with us, you know, has another job. Um, this is not our full-time job. I would love for it to be one day, you know, hopefully somebody would bless, you know, us to, to do that, but it's not. Um, the, the biggest thing I, I want to say is we're in this business to help kids give coaches a platform and showcase programs. And that's why we do it. Um, it's not for any kind of recognition, definitely not for any money, which is probably the same thing you would say if you're coaching. Um, so 95% of people were, were very positive, but you know, the 5% has always bothered me no matter what I do. I, I try to, to please everyone. And when I'm not able to please everyone, it does bother me a little bit. Um, so the message I put out was really more so to say for the 5% that feel like that they didn't get noticed or recognized. Um, we have a long list of names here tonight that we are going to recognize along with the uh, all conference players. So I'm going to ask you to stick around for that. And um, please, if you're watching, uh, once we get to that point, probably around 930, uh, when we're going to start recognizing kids, um, let them know, you know, tune in, check that out. Um, because I know, you know, me personally, when I played at Harding uh, back in the late 90s, we were terrible. But, <laughs> but um, you know, we still had some good uh, players and, and guys that deserved recognition. I, I mean, you know, none of you going to know these names, but Mike Woodard, uh, Rudy Schwartz, Darren Green, um, Jamal Davis, um, you know, the list can go down the line. And even my 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 uh, buddy, Brandon, who, you know, played at Harding and graduated in 01, um, all those guys deserve some love, and we never got it. And it was sickening, you know, to go out there and bust your butt all season long um, running an antiquated offense. <laughs> that's an inside joke. But um, that's the main thing, man. We, we do it because when we were coming up, uh, we worked hard and, you know, felt like no one really recognized us. And I don't want a kid to feel like that ever. So that's why we push the effort so hard to recognize so many kids, you know, out here in different ways. Um, there was one kid that I actually interviewed um, that didn't make the team. And, you know, he was kind of disappointed about that and reached out about it. And I told him, I said, recognition comes in multiple ways. This is not your ending. This is only your beginning. You know, if you feel slighted, you feel some type of way, let that drive you, let that um, fuel you to become better, to be on that list, you know, next season. Or, you know, when you go into college and, and try to progress and turn into a more um, recognized player, you know, don't let this be a downfall, man. Um, I saw, you know, a lot of kids today started following me on Twitter, making new Twitter accounts. That shows that they're listening. How do you get recognition? create a Twitter account. That's where the college coaches are. Recognition from us is not going to get you no money at school. <laughs> I mean, just being real about it, it's going to put you on a radar. I'm not going to lie to you. We've interviewed kids and the next thing you know, they get offers, they get attention. I mean, it does help. It does help, but help us help you. Make a Twitter account. Put your highlights on there. Link them in your profile. Tag us when you're working out. I'll try to retweet everything I'm tagged in because I know how it feels to not be recognized. And I want you to get that recognition, even if it only comes from us, because I know it means something because I didn't get it. 
my teammates didn't get it and they deserved it. So that's what I got to say about sound off. We're going to jump back to our next um, topic that we were talking about previously. And that's, are we going to have football or not? Um, I'm going to bring a couple of the guys back in and coach Billups and coach McClamrock. You just heard coach McClamrock's passionate speech, uh, more like a sermon. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we need to start making some dang on decisions. And I agree. We got to start making some decisions guys. And, and I, I don't, I don't get, you know, why people are so scared to step out on a limb. And Coach McClamrock, you're right. It's kind of like this. You know, I'm waiting on you and you're waiting on me. And, and I don't I can't do this without you. We've seen other state associations make decisions. Give and college programs. Program. Go ahead, Coach. <laughs> And college programs, I mean, imagine you're on the sideline on Friday night. It's third and one. It's in the fourth quarter. You're driving for the tie or for the win, and you're like, uh, uh, what, what play should we call now? Hey, uh, wide receiver coach, what do you think? Uh, offensive line guy, what do you think? Um, uh, a running backs coach, anybody got any ideas? Make a freaking decision. Like, that's what you're getting paid to do. Make a decision. And let's go with it. Whatever it is, we'll go with it. But this whole thing about just keeping us in indecisiveness, like make a decision and let's roll with it and let us know where we need to be moving forward for the next several months. You know, I agree. I agree, man. Um, We've seen South Carolina, you know, they got a direction. Tennessee has a direction. Virginia has a direction. I don't know what's so hard about it. I really don't. But now we're saying make a decision. I'm going to ask both of you, what should that decision be? It's the fall. Like, at the end of the day, North Carolina, North Carolina, we already know how North Carolina High School um, Sports Associated feel about North Carolina Sports High School Sports Associated. It, it, they don't care. And it, it, I hate to say that. That's just the message they're painting right now because, you know, look at our facilities at different schools and – we don't get the same support that South Carolina do um, sport programs get or, you know, any of our neighbors, you know, you know, you don't drag people around. Let's make a plan to say, hey, you know, do like Virginia say, hey, we don't have to play in the, in the spring. It's not fair that you don't that they're probably are going to move to the spring. <laughs> it's not fair that you got these teams out here doing these glorified conditioning for nothing. So you're wasting people's time like. You're getting people's hopes up. So, you know, it's like everybody been saying about the mental health. You know, I'm a very big advocate in the mental health awareness stuff. You can't just like take, you know, me messing with my daughter. I give her a piece of candy and now to snatch out of her hand and then no, you can't have it. You just can't. You can't play with people's emotions like that. And we can't make as coaches. We can't make plans. And then like you, it's not fair. It's, It's like. You wasting you wasting people's time and you playing with people's emotions. Let's say, hey, we don't play in the spring. That I, that's what you that that what they should have been done. The numbers are not going. They're steady, but they're not in a place where we can move to the next phase. So it's a, it, you know make a freaking decision like Coach McClamor said and just start wasting people's time and start playing with. It. And you know I I like what I saw one of the parents. I forgot her name. Um, but it's time for the parents to stop tweeting about it. And I'm not. This not me calling them out. They need to get out there and say something, you know, even with the virtual learning stuff, like a lot of them don't agree with that. It, you know, the school, the school districts, it just need better guidance. It need to be a lot of better guidance. And we're, you just can't stop <coughs> passing the buck. They keep passing the buck and it's getting tired. You're getting tired. I'm tired of it. And that's one of the reasons why I left um, Charlotte Mecklenburg school system. It just, I couldn't do it no more. It just, it, it, but I'm just glad to finally getting shown that they don't care it's just they don't care and it's not right you know you need you need you're not even them the darn coach that they stipend right now that's that's crazy like some of them depend on them. that's how they budget their money but hey they don't care nobody cares until it happens to them you know coach billis i'm gonna tell you what i agree with everything you just said there he said i'm gonna take it just a little bit different man you're talking about giving candy to your beautiful daughter and then take it away from her this is what's happening the state keeps saying we're gonna give you your candy hey next time i go to the store i'm gonna give you yeah. the candy. and then you go to the store and you don't give her the candy and you're like oh shoot next time i promise you and you go to the store the next day and you don't bring the candy home 
Like, that's what's going on. Like, my whole thing is, and you said it as well, like, it's not about opinion. It should be about what do the statistics tell us? Like, when all this mess first happened and there was all the debate, like, I was very outspoken on social media. I thought schools sh should have shut down with what the stats were saying in Europe and Italy. Like, we had to shut it down to try to control this thing. And all the people were like, well, I don't feel like we should have shut, shut schools down. It doesn't matter what your feelings say. Well, when should we open it up? It doesn't matter what I think. It's what do the statistics say? And so here's my question, state of North Carolina, North Carolina High School Athletic Association. We've had schools that have been working out for six weeks. Mm -hmm. What stats do we see from those six weeks? Every single season, at the end of the football season, I had to turn in how many kids in my program got a concussion. So mm -hmm. that the, the county and the state could keep track of the concussion count. Are we doing better at teaching, tackling, and teaching, blocking? What are we doing? For six weeks, you've been able to, to compile statistics on the teams that have been working out. How many cases of COVID-19 have, have, uh, 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 have they gotten? How many high school kids that have been involved in these summer workouts had a case of the COVID-19 so bad that they were hospitalized? And how many kids have died from this? And if the answer is zero of dad, and the answer is zero have been hospitalized, and the answer is, uh, we don't know how many guys have contracted the virus. Why not? Why not? Why have the head football coaches and the athletic directors and the county athletic directors and the North Carolina High School Athletic Association, why have they not been keeping up with this for six weeks? They knew what was coming. They knew what was coming. They know what's at stake. What are the stats saying? And somebody tell me what the stats are because I haven't seen any stats on that except for one or two isolated potential COVID-19 cases, but they're not sure if they got it at practice because no one else on the team got it or they got it when they went to Myrtle Beach. What are the statistics saying? And if you haven't been monitoring that, state of North Carolina, you haven't really wanted to get back to playing football this year, man. That's just facts. Plain and simple. If you're not monitoring it, you're not ready to get back. Just say you're not ready to get back. Say we're going to shut it down until 2021. Say we're going to shut it down until whenever. Let us know. You and know, I, I'm going to tell you, man, here's my, my problem. And I know, you know, we want direction from the state association, but I'll give them this much credit. At least they're, you know, letting people go in the phase two. The problem is, is is for, for from a Charlotte perspective, it to me is CMS and yeah. Coach Billups. You you mentioned it earlier. Um, when you look at CMS, you know we've got an ability to practice right now. We've had you know right now, you know several coaches on the past couple of weeks. They have all said we should be practicing right now. Um, Coach McClanrock, you mentioned the numbers. You know the numbers say you know it, it is an overwhelmingly safe to practice. You know, covering these camps, um, you know, the camps give these kids an opportunity to compete, thank goodness, and, you know, get some some work in. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you, there, there are precautions being taken at these camps. Um, you know, you have to go in and get screened and temperature checked and, you know, you got to wear your mask. And, you know, over at the sports plex, they, they didn't let, you know, the people onto the field. Um if a private group is able to do this and we have not heard any, you know, of, of any COVID-19 outbreak from the camps, you know, this past weekend where we had kids in close contact with each other, if they're allowed to do it and, you know, doing it in a safe manner and everything's just fine, I, I have to question because it happened here in Charlotte. So why can't we safely practice and under stricter conditions if we are in CMS and you know, you know, all the ADs and all the coaches are going to take every precaution to do it safely because they don't want to get in trouble and lose the chance of being with their kids, which is what we need right now. I mean, there are, are kids that are struggling out here. Um, you know, they reach out to me and, and DM and they're asking about camps and, you know, they're desperate for something to, to leech on to, to get some film and, and to um, just compete against someone and to try to stay in shape because we don't know when we're going to play. Um, and that's the biggest thing. Like Coach Chadwick came on last week and said, hey, 
you know, right now we're supposed to be uh, starting September 1st. Obviously, that's out the window now. But at the time, you know, he was saying that's, we're not going to have enough time to, you know, play a game, you know, because our kids are not going to be in game shape. Um, but at the end of the day, it comes back down to the fact we know Coach Billups with our experience with CMS, they're going to err on the side of least risk. So <laughs> here's what I'm saying to you. Don't count on CMS doing what what should be done in, in the right manner. Assume we are not going to practice at all. Assume there is not going to be fall football. Assume that they are not working to get you to a point to where you're going to play in the fall and make the best decision for you based off those assumptions. I will be shocked if we have football in CMS in the fall. Shocked at this point. Um, and in saying that, I would say the best decision to make is to go ahead and say we're going to move it to the early spring, like we've seen in some models. Um, we've had the winter season with basketball and you know things of that nature. And then we have you know football after that. I'm not a fan of it. We're going to lose some kids to graduation, early graduation, and go to college. And they're going to become, you know, stars. <clears throat> that's great, but that's what that's what I'm planning for. That's what I'm planning for. We're going to do the show. We're going to talk football regardless. But here in Charlotte, I think that's what it's going to end up being if we end up playing at all. I think it's that or no football at all. What do y'all think? Pep, I'll say this right quick. I agree with you, but the thing they don't have to change is their perspective on the virtual the virtual learning. Like, we're hearing that they talking about they might not say, just because we're doing virtual learning, they might let not let the kids play the sport. Why? Why not? They didn't go out there and make COVID. You know, we don't. We need to do virtual learning. I, I agree with that. But even, you know, me having experience with Canvas, there's so many issues with that. And now you don't increase that bandwidth and have all these people on this on the stuff. And then you got to think about people's home life. They might not, not saying they don't have internet or Wi-Fi, but they might have, their parents got to go to work. And now you tell me your bro, your little brother and sister, you're not going to be able to focus all the time. So you might see a decline in some grades and stuff like that. We're not thinking about the big picture. We're not thinking about everybody got the right situation. What about these kids who got tougher situations and they got to, they may have to work. Now they, you know, they're home. They, they got to work a little bit more and stuff like that. You're not thinking about the big picture, and they're not it, seeing it, 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 it. Like my experience with CMS, it, like Pep said, they always take the low risk thing. Like they have so many opportunities to help Hardy, um, West Med, West Charlotte, private. It's so any old school that was not built <laughs> recently, their facilities are, are terrible. And it doesn't make sense. That, and this is not no shot at nobody who get who got turf and getting re, their turf redone. It don't make sense that we got these number of schools with turf and everybody don't have turf. Like, my part need turf. South Metsfield, man, South Met, you mean you go to Providence. Y'all, you know, y'all pick this picture because Michael Bear does a great job on that field. We had to squeeze the field in a monsoon to play Sensical Bears. I do it when we had to play West Met one year. It, it's not a cakewalk. And then, you know, they just got to do better, man. It's not like you just think about it. It's like CMS don't care. And I'm not saying they care about them making sure we got them tests and they don't get paid for them tests. That's what they care about. And you got to know you got to know a little bit about education. That's what they care about. They care about them tests now. But when they care about the overall picture for these kids, they don't really care. They don't throw them out to the wolves. Yeah, Ken, you got last shot here, Phil. Coach, Coach Billups brought up so many, so many good points there. Um, this, this is what I'm gonna finish with. Once again, let's go back to statistics. What have we been monitoring, and what have we seen? What have we gathered? AAU basketball has been going on for longer than high schools across the state have been working out. They're packed in cramped gyms. They're they're rubbing up against each other. They're breathing on each other. What have we seen coming out of there? Every county has a health alliance that monitors and traces where the virus is spreading, where is it coming from. And then I'm going to go back to what Coach Phillips said again. Um, 
about about kids being at home during this virtual all learning. When Cabarrus County Schools two weeks ago came out with their phase plan three or whatever it's called, plan C, where we were going to be home 100 percent. My wife, who has a mental health background, she was a counselor for a number of years before she became a full time stay at home mom. My wife almost broke down in tears because she's seen the kids that I've worked with for 18 years. She knows where they live. She knows what type of living environment some of these kids have. And Coach Billup just talked about bandwidth. I know so many of my kids who live in an 800 square foot apartment or smaller, and there are three, four, five kids living under one roof, and three or four of them are school aged. Number one, not only can they not find a place uh, 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 independently of one another inside their home to, to a quiet space where they can hear their teacher and they can learn, but you're right, they're not gonna have the bandwidth. I mean, we've seen on this show, we've seen with almost us, all of us and, and guests, where the bandwidth froze up. We didn't have a great signal. We didn't have a great connection. And we're all adults with professional careers. And we're still struggling with that. And it makes no sense to me that we expect in Cabarrus County, now I'm going to put myself out there here for a second. We're doing synchronous learning, which means at 715, we're going to start teaching live teaching. We've got kids in our school system that barely make it to class in person. I've gone and picked kids up at 6.50, 7 o'clock. I've had coaches go and pick kids up who had first period planning to get them to school. I've called people to get rides, to get people to school. But now we're saying those kids who are barely showing up as it is, now we're expecting them to jump on a computer, jump on a laptop, jump on their cell phone, and sit in front of a screen for six and seven hours at a time? And then in Cabarrus County, we're offering them a 30 minute lunch period. Like my understanding is it's federal law. We got to offer kids lunch at Central Cabarrus. We had a breakfast before school. After first period, we had a second chance breakfast where kids who who were running late to school could still go and get their breakfast, mostly free reduced breakfast situations. And then obviously we have the lunch period. We, we are not doing our kids right right now. And Coach Billups said it so eloquently, man, the mental health is suffering and, and it's not right. It's not fair. If you're going to err on the side of caution, say it. Football shut down, basketball shut down, wrestling shut down until such and such a date. And let's go. Kids need this. We know it. I've had so many kids over the years that say that, that self-awareness that say, I know that I needed football or else I would have been in this place. I won't say the school, but I've had a kid who was roughed up in some really, really bad situations at a school where he had been. He transferred to the school where I was, and he told me, he said, Coach, all of my people, all they do is gangbang and shoot each other up. When you see it on the news, those are my people. Those are who I hang out with. I knew that I had to transfer to another school to get out of that situation, and we ain't getting them out of that situation right now, and it's not right. We got to do better. We got to make a decision, whatever that is so that kids can move on with their lives and they can figure out what the next step is for them. Amen. All right. I, I tell you, man, the, the passion and the fire on this is is just unbelievable. And I, I totally echo those sentiments, guys. Thank you so much for bringing the um, energy and the di direct conversation we need to have, you know, on this topic. Um, but now we are very excited to bring on our third head coach of the night. Um, you know, this this guy has done a great job over the years. Um, offense coordinator at West Rowan, also head coach at West Rowan. Now he's leading the uh, Morrisville Blue Devils. Um, I know the community is excited to, to have him and to hear from him tonight. And um, that is Joe Nixon, the Morrisville Blue Devils new head coach. We're going to bring him on now with us. Coach, how you doing tonight? Um, hit hit that microphone, Coach. There we go. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> how you doing, Pep? Man, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Everything's good. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Glad to have you on here tonight with us. Thanks for coming on. Um, obviously, um, before we jump into everything else, I do want to, you know, obviously address um, Yap and Sharp. Um, wearing my CFI blue shirt, 
um, obviously to honor him. I see you've got your Mooresville blue shirt on. Uh, what can you say about that young man? You were on the West Rowland side last year when they honored him. And then now, obviously, you're here with Mooresville. Yeah, you know, uh, just a tragic, tragic event um, that took place. And, you know, not knowing Gavin personally, but just hearing the stories from our players and our community, um, you can just tell uh, how good of a young man he was, uh, uh, how great of a friend and teammate and classmate he was. And, uh, you know, you just see that in the whole community, the way they rally around him. And, you know, he still have a, he still has a huge impact in Mooresville right now. Absolutely. We see the comments from people watching right now, you know, hashtag Gavin Strong and hashtag Gavin Strong with 63. Um, but that was just a, a just profound moment last year uh, when I was at that game. Uh, just, you know, just a, a tough, tough situation. And, um, you know, glad that, you know, you guys are able to honor him in the right way. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and jump into this. So now, obviously, we've been talking about should we be playing high school football? Should we be practicing? Uh, I want to ask you the same question we've been asking other coaches. Uh, in your opinion, should we be practicing right now, number one? And then number two, in your opinion, are we going to be playing football in the fall or is it looking more like early spring to you? Uh, you know, it's like I tell our players, uh, you know, we're going to worry about what we can control. Uh, everybody wants to play football. Um, you know, every football player, every football coach wants to play. Uh, but, you know, the people that are making decisions are also making decisions with everybody's best interest in. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you can fault anyone's decision. Um, you know, everybody has an opinion on what we should be doing. Um, but in Morsel, we're only going to worry about what we can control. And whenever they tell us we can play, we're going to be ready to play. And, uh, you know, do I think we're going to have a season? I, I met with our guys last week, and I do think we're going to have a season. I just don't know when it's going to be. Um, and our biggest thing is whenever it is going to be, we're going to be ready to play. That's smoking like a true football coach right there. <laughs> I like that. I like that, man. Um, so, obviously, you know, transitioning from West Rand to Mooresville, how has that transition been? And, you know, you feel like you settled in now with Mooresville and developing that relationship with your kids and, um, you know, feeling like you're, you're good to go with that? Well, you know, the, the thing is when, when we took over, um, we are in COVID protocol. Um, you know, fortunate enough with great support, we were able to get some things done online and met, met with the team online. Uh, we actually got some workouts in. I felt like, uh, you know, we started building those relationships with the players. Um, for the weeks that we got to work out with them. Um, and then we continue to do it virtually. Um, it's not ideal, but, you know, everybody's going through the same thing right now. So we're going, we're not going to make any excuses and we're going to keep working hard at what we're trying to do and what we're trying to build. Well said coach. Well said. Um, I want to go back a little bit, obviously to your time at Western Wayne, And I want to ask you about Scott Young. Um, Scott Young, a great head coach. Uh, when I was at Harding, you know, we played, you know, up at West Rand in the playoffs. And, um, man, the, I remember our head coach, Mark Sanders, was talking about your running game. It was like trying to tackle a Mack truck coming downhill. Uh, just uh, incredible stuff. Um, what What are your thoughts on Scott Young and um, just in general in your time at West Rand? Because you had a lot of success there. Uh, you know, my – I'll forever be grateful for Coach Young. Um, you know, he took me in as a, a young coach right out of college. He kind of took me under his wing and kind of prepared me to be a head football coach. Uh, you know, I, I learned an awful lot from him. Uh, the thing about Coach Young is, like any great head coach, they're going to surround themselves with good assistant coaches. And, uh, you know, he, he let his assistant coaches coach, and uh, he, he managed the team. Uh, he was a great football coach, a great football mind. Uh, he did a great job of just blending a whole bunch of different personalities and everybody had the respect for him to, to be able to work underneath them. And, you know, you know, we don't win as much as we, as we've won without the great players we had. Uh, any good coach will tell you, uh, you know, you got to have good players to be good. And we were blessed to have some really, really good players and we had a great staff. Um, everything just went right for us. 
Absolutely. Just a great run um, up at West Row and um, just <laughs> incredible teams and incredible players. Like you said, uh, the running back uh, parks, you know, comes to mind. Just good Lord, that running game. Oh, this crazy. Um, I, I want to ask you, uh, what what can <laughs> what can we expect uh, from you guys scheme wise, you know, offensively, defensively at Mooresville uh, this season? Are you more of a, a of a system guy or do you kind of, you know, kind of adjust things to the personnel you have on the team? Well, I, I'd like to think we try to adjust to what we have on our team. Um, you know, coming from West Rowan, everybody thinks we're, we're run heavy, run heavy, and we are run heavy. But uh, I feel like we've evolved to the RPO game. Um, you know, we're not scared to throw the football. My offensive coordinator was a quarterback, so he likes to throw the football. But we're also going to be smart on what we do. Um, you know, we, we'd like to be 50-50 balanced and uh, pick and choose our shots and can control the line of scrimmage. And on defensively, you know, we've always been a 4 2 5 team, um, but, you know, with the ability to get an odd front also. So, you know, we're still we're still in the early stages of knowing what our guys can do. We've seen them move around. We've seen them run. But, you know, football is a game of contact. And until we see guys hit, we really don't know what we got right now. Amen to that, man. Everyone, I, what's the great saying? You always got to plan till you get hit in the mouth. I think that's what how it goes, or something along those lines. And uh, you're absolutely right, man. You got to be physical, number one, to do anything you know in the game of football. You got to be physical. Uh, what are your expectations in year one? What do you think this Morrisville team can do uh, in playing the, in the tough IMAC conference? You know. You know, we, we go in every game expecting we're going to win. Um, I, and I feel like that that's what every coach probably feels like. Um, you know, I know we're in a very tough league. Uh, you know, that's that's where you want to be. As a high school coach, as a high school player, you want to play in big games. So we've always tried to – we've always tried to schedule tough non-conference games. We always look forward to playing in the big games in conference. Um, you know, you want to experience that as a high school player. Um, so, you know, we'll prepare every week to go out to win. And I, I firmly believe that we'll have a shot in every single game. And if we ever stop stop believing that, we probably need to get out. But our, our plan is to prepare to win every game, and you know we're going we're going to work like we are the team to beat. And you know we know our conference is very tough, and we know if we can compete in our conference, we got a chance to make a run in December. Well said, exactly, exactly. I mean, there's no better case than that than Vance. They finished third in the IMEC last year and they ended up winning the state title. So, you know, proof is in the pudding right there. Um, we got a lot of your players uh, named on our IMEC preseason all-conference team. Um, talk about some of those guys and then some other guys that you feel like are able to make an impact for you uh, this upcoming season. Yeah, I mean, obviously, on um, offense, you got Glenwood Robinson. Um, you know, you got uh, Ridge Schwartz, um, Ashton Edstrom. Those guys are dynamic football players on the offensive side of the ball. Um, you know, and then defensively, you got uh, Fred Brown, uh, uh, Caleb Tate, and I think uh, Nazir's on there also, and then – Elijah Wilson in the back end in the secondary. All those guys are really good football players. Um, you know, we got some other guys that uh, – younger guys that I think are going to have really good years for us. Um, you know, the, the thing about it, the, what I've noticed since I've been at Morrison and I, we're able to be around the guys for just a little bit of time, man, every single player we have, every kid – and we saw 94 different players, um, you know, so we were able to see a lot of our guys – you know, all the players are just tremendous young men, um, you know, excited to be out, excited to be playing, very respectful, very coachable. And, you know, that's that's the part of it that as a coach, you, you really you really enjoy. Um, you know, everybody knows the great players. Um, everybody reads about them, hears about them. But overall, as a team, I, I think we've got some really good kids, uh, some really good young men. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun working with them. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, just in talking to a couple of the kids, you know, in interviews and then just, you know, talking to them, you know, in general on Twitter or social media, uh, very respectful, hardworking. Um, I, I totally agree with what you said there. Some very good kids. Um, they, they're not all about me. 
they're all about the team and working out together and, you know, pushing the team aspect of Mooresville football. Um, so I, I hit, you hit the nail on the head on that one, uh, coach. Um, once again, man, I want to appreciate you um, for coming on here with us, talking a little bit about yourself and your time at West Moran and all about what's going on at Mooresville. And I hope <laughs> we're able to come to a practice here soon and, uh, you know, catch up with you. Uh, I like doing these things in person more so than virtual, but we got to do what we got to do right now. And, um, you know, Coach, I hope I hope we see you soon. man. Absolutely. I, I appreciate what you do for our players uh, and, and for the state of North Carolina. Um, you know, I think you do, you guys do a great job promoting our sport. And uh, if there's anything that we can do at Moore's, well, please let us know, and you're welcome anytime. Thank you so much, Coach. We appreciate it, man. Hey, you can go ahead. You can go ahead and drop that hashtag party at the pop. <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching on the comments, throw it up. We'll put it on the screen. <laughs> uh, all right, Pat. Appreciate you. Thank you, Coach. We'll see you, all man. Right, all right. All right, so that was head coach, uh, Mooresville Blue Devils, uh, Joe Nixon. Uh, obviously, um, very excited to have him on and talk about what's going on up at Mooresville. Um, uh, just a great school with good people, uh, great fan support, um, and everything going on. All right, now we're getting to the point in the show that I'm sure everyone has been waiting for. Let your friends know. Let your family know. We're going to talk about players right now, and we're going to bring the coaches back um, because we all are going to talk about some players here in just a second. Uh, I'm going to keep everyone on the screen at the moment. Um, so like Coach Billup said, we took a lot of time in looking at making the team, um, and we expanded the rosters. Uh, because of all the talent in the IMAC conference. Um, I had one comment about that. Um, honestly, you have all these kids here um, that have offers or commitments. We had uh, one that committed today, as a matter of fact. Um, they were all deserving, in my opinion. And even then, we still left some kids off because – Everyone can't be on the team, but there were so many that I felt like we needed to um, expand the team. So we're going to talk about some of those kids right now. I am going to throw the hashtag up that Coach mentioned, Party at the Pop <laughs> for Mooresville. Uh, we did get a couple people throwing that on there, so I'm going <laughs> to give that a little bit of time right there. Oh, uh, there's another one. We might be no. getting party. But no, no, <laughs> make sure we, uh, we um, ruin that party. <laughs> We're gonna get to predictions in a minute, coach. We're gonna get to predictions. I'll be a guy. I love Mooresville, man. That, <laughs> All right, so I've got quarterbacks, running backs, and athlete positions. So I'm gonna talk about them first. Um quarterback position. Um we we looked at a number of quarterbacks, um, but we're only going to uh we only put two on the team. Uh, number one, of course, um, and I'm not ranking them. I'm just saying the first one I'm going to talk about is Austin Greer. Um, Austin was a um, a dual threat quarterback. Um, obviously led the Vance Cougars to the state championship. Um, he's got some Ivy League offers that tell you that he is a very smart kid. Um, you know, the performance at Richmond last year in the playoffs, you know, really cinched this for me. Um, just incredible. I mean, you're playing for a state title on the road and to come out and do what he did in the third quarter was just tremendous. Um, and then Tad Hudson for Huff. I mean, I tell you, he got an offer from uh, South Carolina today. He's got several power five offers. Uh, we interviewed him, you know, a few weeks back. Uh, very charismatic kid. You know, you can tell, you know, why people want him off the field and then on the field, it just enhances it. Um, strong arm, uh, bright future. He's got a couple more years to go. Um, you can tell he's going to be a leader in that Huff offense already just as a, a young sophomore. And then his performance in the playoffs at Richmond really put him on the map. I think he got like three offers the day after uh, that Richmond game, even though they lost, he put up a ton of yards and to go down there as a freshman and do that was just phenomenal. 
Um, so those were our two all-conference quarterbacks. Um, other kids I want to talk about at the quarterback position, we interviewed Xavier Brower to kick off the IMEC week. Um, you know, left-handed quarterback. Um, he's been on JV, um, doing a great job leading that offense. Um, I've seen him, you know, at the camp. He was at the Carolina Experience Camp uh, this past weekend. Looked great. Um, looks like he's really been working hard, added some – you know, weight to his frame, throwing a good ball. Uh, he threw a beautiful back shoulder, um, looked like a comeback to um, Elijah Metcalf that was just pinpoint accurate. Um, you know, I think as a junior, his time is now. He's grown up in the Mountain Creek program. Um, you know, I think he's – he. you know, I think that whole Mountain Creek team has a chip on their shoulder. Um, you know, a lot of people are assuming that they're going to fall off a little bit. And then just talking to – you know, him and a couple of other kids, um, they got a real quiet confidence. That JV team was dominant. And a lot of those kids are moving up now, and it's their time on varsity, and they got a point to prove. And um, it's going to be real interesting to see how that comes out. Uh, Anthony, I hope I say this right, Anthony Lamone, uh, quarterback at Lake Norman. Um, running that offense, you know, is not easy um, from that position. You're going to get hit a lot. You're running option. Um, a lot of people don't run that version of the option that they run. It's old school stuff, but, you know, he runs it well. You got to know, you know, a lot of reads in the run game. Um, your dive read, your keep read, pitch read. Um, and they run all of that stuff, you know, different kind of handoffs, pitches, all kind of stuff. He does it well, and he's able to run himself. And then they, when they do throw the ball, I was looking at some film today, he's putting, the, <clears throat> excuse me, he's putting the ball on point. Um, when you don't throw much, that's hard to do in the rhythm of a game. You're running a run first offense when you're off the play action stuff. You know, the ball is catchable. Um, he puts it where it needs to be. Um, you know, he, he's a good leader for that offense up there. And then a name that some people probably forgot about because he didn't play last year, but Coach Billups knows this guy, and that's Josh Mahaffa at West Charlotte. Um, I saw him as a freshman. Um, and I see Coach Billups dancing off camera. <laughs> but I saw him as a freshman. I believe it was his first start when they came over to Harding a couple years ago. And as a freshman, he threw, I think it was two or three touchdown passes in a, in a big win for them. And we interviewed him after the game. You know, he's a well-spoken young man. Um, he's He had the size back then. I'm sure he's grown now, put on some weight and – um. I know he's going to give Coach Griner's offense a passing threat that a lot of people probably are not expecting. Uh, but I know what you got over there, Coach. I know what you got. <laughs> All right, so for the running back position, um, obviously Evan Pryor, um, he had a tweet um, today. I think it said uh, people love to sing his failures but whisper his praises. But I'm going to sing his praises because I'm going to tell you something. Evan Pryor, when he was at R.G. Kill, you know, as a freshman, we highlighted him back in my um, Carolina varsity days. I thought he was a real dynamic kid. He was catching the ball out the backfield really well. Um, you know, just being a freshman, he didn't have, you know, the power, you know, to run in between the tackles, but they, you know, used his strengths well. And then moving on to Huff, you know, you could see the transformation, you know, just happening with him. Um, when I visited with Huff a couple of years ago, they were doing um, conditioning and, you know, it was a tough, tough session. You know, everyone was, you know, kind of, you know, struggling through it. Um, and he, he kept pushing through it. He kept pushing through it, even though it was hard and it was tough. And I said to myself, you know, we know this kid's going to be special, but, um, just to see the growth from his freshman year at AK to what he is now is just, tremendous and i'm so happy for the kid you know going to ohio state and gonna put on for the 704 and i know he's gonna do big things um he's a, a really really nice kid to talk to comes from a great family um just um just a really really good kid really good kid man happy for you evan um joseph morris advance um you know i remember coach brand you know, telling me that this kid was going to be special. Um, God, I think it's almost three years ago now. And, um, you know, 
he's not a kid. Once again, like Coach Furby said earlier, they don't seek out the spotlight. They don't seek out the attention. And this kid is the same way. He just goes about his business. He runs hard. Um, he, he's a playmaker in that offense. He gets the, the tough yardage, the downhill yardage. Um, but I, I, he's, a, he's a kid that you know is going to get it done. And um, he's got breakaway speed ability. Um, he's got power. He's got great vision. That's what I really love about his game. Um, and then he can catch the ball at the backfield as well. So, um, yeah, I remember in the playoffs, matter of fact, in Butler in the first round, he caught a wheel route for a touchdown. That was just beautiful. He ran a beautiful route and got open on that. So he can, you know, he can do it all, man. Good, good kid. Um, Glenwood Robinson, more so we just talked to Coach Nixon, uh, mentioned him. Um, I've always liked his game. Um, he's a downhill runner. That's the best way I can describe him. He's got good speed, um, really good vision on the inside runs. Um, you know, he was a little banged up last year, but, you know, when he's healthy, you know, he's pound for pound one of the best backs in the IMAC. That's why he's on this list. And a great kid, too. I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago. Really well spoken. Yes, sir. No, sir. Model kid you want for your program. And then uh, P.J. Hinton, when we talked about um, kids that we were looking at on film, this was one of the kids that really stood out to me and Coach Billups. We were going down looking and seeing, you know, who deserves to be on here. Um, I tell you, a lot of people don't know his name, but, you know, this kid has all the ability in the world. And then at Mallard Creek, you know, you get so much talent there. Um, that you almost have to wait your turn. But when they gave him the ball, you know, he did some impressive things with it. And you go look at his huddle. You'll see why he's on this list. And um, I'm going to shout him out, too. He reached out to me today in DM. He was one of the kids that reached out and thanked me for uh, putting him on the list. But, you know, thank Coach Billups on that, too, because, you know, he helped out on that one. We, we were looking at him like, OK, what's his name? What's his name? And, you know, Coach Bills was able to find out his name. And, you know, I'm glad we were able to give him, you know, the recognition that he deserved on that. Now, two running backs that didn't make it. And it's it was very, very tough. You know, it was tough at all the positions to decide who um, should be on here and who shouldn't. Uh, we see the Malcolm AD, Quante Spate. Thank you for watching. It says PJ is the ideal back. Um, yeah. Yeah, you look at his film, man, checking him out. Seriously. Um, Dalen Smothers advance. I'm going to tell you something, man. I went back and forth on this. Went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, um, you know, it was very, very tough to decide who should be on, who should be, who should, you know, maybe uh, not be on. But this kid, man. <sighs> I mean, good gracious. I mean, when you score as a freshman in the state championship game, what what can you say? I mean, the, the sky is the limit for this kid. I mean, it, it it really is. I interviewed him. He was one of the first interviews we did in the offseason. Wonderful kid to talk to. Great personality. Um, God almighty. I mean, deserving. Deserving to be on. There's so much talent in this league. And then another name you may not know, uh, but also deserving Jordan Hansen, uh, North Mech. Another kid we looked at film on, great size. My goodness, great size for the running back position. Runs with power, runs behind his pads. Um, he's a punishing runner. Um, just, just good stuff with him. Um, and then we look at the athlete position. Um, Songa Yates, you know, advance. Um, just a, a really, really, really special kid. Um, highlighting him at North Mech, um, just a demon on special teams. I remember he had a um, a big game against Harding in their win last year. Um, I think we named – I think he was either player of the game or player to watch or something along those lines. But he was all-conference special teams player uh, last year. And, you know, you look at his film and you see some of his workout stuff. Um, I think he, he was the one that caught a ball while flipping or something like that. Just incredible athletic ability. Um, so he definitely deserved to be on. Uh, Ashton Edstrom at Mooresville, another kid that we've interviewed. Hard, hard, hard worker, man. 
Um, but he's got ability too. Um, I remember last year at the game against Vance, that was the marquee play that I remember for him. He took a jet sweep. I think it was 86 yards against probably the best defense in the state um, and ran away from people. And when I saw that, I was like, okay. At the time, I wasn't sure who he was. I just looked at the roster and said, okay, Ashton Edstrom. I got to remember that name and find out who he is. And um, just just incredible stuff, man. He deserved to be on. Caleb Washington at Mallet Creek. I'm going to tell you something, man. <laughs> we put him at athlete because he literally plays multiple positions. Um, I mean, just natural, just natural. I mean, when I looked at his film yesterday, he was playing a receiver, most of the stuff that I was watching, just so fluid, um, catching the ball, um, run after the catch, um, just a dynamic athlete, man, just, just really – really special player um expecting a, a big season out of him this year um and then antonio smith at west charlotte um what can i say about this kid and his story um we interviewed him you know uh, i think it was a couple months ago now at this point but you know he was at garinger um you know, he he was really a part of, you know, the, the little turnaround they had over there and being competitive and winning a couple games. Um, you know, and then, you know, if you watch his story, you know, he had to overcome some health issues to just to play a little bit. Um, he's going to be at West Charlotte this upcoming season. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if Coach Billups knows where he's going to play yet, but <laughs> well, he I don't think he's going to say. <laughs> but he's a, a great, great kid. And when the ball's in his hands, things are going to happen. And he can play defense, too. Um, I remember, um, God, my Coach Caldwell telling me he's a, probably a better defender than he is an offensive player. So um, you see the scroll. Um, if you're coming in and catching who's on and who's not who we're talking about, we'll have that scrolling as the guys are talking. But um, the one athlete I, I feel like we, we should have, you know, possibly got on here with DJ Maltzby at Hopewell. I love that kid. I think he's really good in space. I'm interested to see with him moving to the quarterback position, how that's going to transform the uh, Hopewell offense. I know Coach Grice is a mad scientist and drawing things up, so I know he's got some some different stuff ready to go, um, hopefully when we get ready to play here. Um, but I'll tell you something about him. You know, I reached out to him. I wanted to interview him. And, um, you know, he was honest with me. He said, you know, he's not one for the spotlight necessarily in the social media stuff. And, um, you know, that's, you know, like I said, you know, that's not something you hear very much. <laughs> so that tells you, you know, he's a focused young man on getting the job done. And, um, you know, he's he's deserving to be on this list. So I have talked enough <laughs> of bringing the guys back because we're going to move into the next position. And that is going to be the wide receiver position where we had a ton of talent. Um, before we move on, is there anyone in the quarterback, running back, athlete position you guys feel like, you know, we could have added on? It is a, you, like I said, um, Hanson, North, uh, North Met, that running back, that's a, Boy, that's a bad joker right there. Um, I think you hit the nail on the coffin with Mallard Creek um, quarterback coming up. I think people are really sleep on that young man. That young man, he reminded me of young Coach Billups, like how I grew up in the West Charlotte, loving, loving um, everything in West Charlotte. I remember going to the games when I was eight year old, nine year old, seeing oh, yeah. Keith Mackins, keep seeing all the, seeing a whoop up on Harden run the scoreboard. I got to do it myself my 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th right, grade on. years while I was at West Show. So, you know, fun thing. <laughs> but, no, it's, it's it's different when you grow up in them environments and you be like, man, I can't wait to go to Mallet Creek and the um, West Shaw at the Vances. And that's what you're seeing now. So, I love it. I think he's a sleeper. P.J. Hinton. I I think I was watching his highlights. Said, "How we don't stop this? It, 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 it's some backs, man. I met got backs, and it's a bunch of athletes. And DJ um 
Yeah, Hulk will. I'm very yeah. curious to see yeah. what they do with him. He's 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 gonna be a problem. They do it the right way, which you know, Coach Rice and Coach Bird don't make sure it happens. So, good list. All right, we got wide receivers, Coach Billups. You got. Oh man, the the money team, like my boy Coach Q would like to say. Um, <laughs> um, I'm gonna highlight with a receiver I wish was at Hopewell when I was there. We probably would have won more than one game in the two years while I was there. But hey, you know, <laughs> um, Julian Gray. I watched this kid tape um, as a DB coach. You know, I watched releases. I watched how they come off the ball. This kid coming off the ball, he is. I don't think he get enough credit. I never. We you got to bring your whole kitchen sink to tackle this kid because he don't keep moving his feet. Them feet keep chopping. And, you know, he, he he's a really ideal slot receiver. I like what he does. Um, Coleman, Jeff, Jeff Coat, the um, kid, I think he, um, he, um, he committed to Temple today, right? Yes. 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 That dude, <laughs> he's physical. He's fast. He's, he's mean. He's tall. You can't coach height. And, I like him, you know, watching his film, you know, I like seeing receivers put some blocking on that film. Like Coach McClan right there, that's old school football, man. I like seeing you get out there and put your hands on somebody. So he's nasty, you know, he's that outside receiver. Um, Josiah Davis, I had to call my um, my good friend Deshaun Baker and get some info on him because, you know, he was at Providence Day. Um, I watched his film. He looks good, you know. He he's he runs right. He's fast and he got good hands. He coming, at, you know. I think he's gonna play on the outside for um coach um Baker over there. Um, Kevin, I don't mess your name up, but over there the freshman phenom <laughs> advance, one of Coach Q's money team members. You all saw what he did in the playoff. He tore Richmond County up. <laughs> he 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 went on a tear. It was like a a Kevin show. <laughs> during that um playoff, it was it got ugly. You know, you saw a freshman out there dogging them, their Richmond County superior secondary, which it was a lot of talent. And then you saw what he did in the state championship game. You know, he well deserving of it. Um, um. Then we got num Mr. Number Nine over there, West Shaw, Mr. Morrow. Um, it's something about wearing number nine in West Shaw. You know, you start thinking of. All the great people wore number nine. No, Coach Bills didn't wear number nine. I wore 37. <laughs> but no, I wore 37 because you got to take extra 37 to get to the dub, baby. Yeah, okay. But number nine is it's a sacred number. Um, This young man, he was a freshman, and I was very impressed. I'm very excited to get the chance to watch him grow as an um, uh, athlete, and hopefully he stay around. My, my nemesis here, Mr. Elijah Metcalf, this young man, has some of the best feet and runs on the best routes I've ever seen in my life. It, it, it's a, I put him on the same um, category as um, the receiver at um, Huff, Noah. Um, not Noah, I mess it up, y'all. Um, it's one of them days. But um, Mr. <laughs> Man, he's he can play slot, he can play outside. You put him anywhere, he don't tear you up, he don't cut you up. We did um, seven on seven against um, them last year while I was at Providence. And he said, watch me cut your boy up right here, coach. And <laughs> sure enough, he cut him up. And I was mad. Um, Mr. Sutton over there um, at Huff, too. I, like I said, you know, Baker, he just keep getting rich over there. He, 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 he brutes just keep coming to him. This kid right here, he his first three um, um, highlights are him driving kids, like, to the ground, getting pancake blocks. You really don't see that from the receiver. He's mean. He's he fits where he's going to app. Um, I really like that kid. And Jacob Polite at Hopewell, I think he don't get enough credit that he deserved. Like Bird said, this kid, you put him on an island and you throw that ball up, he's gonna come down and get it. Um I I really I really want to see how they are incorporate him more into the offense. I really would like to see that. And um he's he's gonna be dangerous here. Yeah, he yeah, he is too smooth, Q. <laughs> but um, there's so many other kids um, that didn't make it. Mikael Baldwin, I hope I say that right, Q, um, over there at um, Vance. That kid, he's a steal. Um, he put some tape out of him just coming out and running um, an in route. And, you know, you're just watching him, his releases and stuff like that. It's nasty. Um, 
it's just so many of them kids at Vance. I think Vance got a kid who played basketball. I forgot his name. I didn't ask um, Coach Wright about him earlier, but he plays basketball. He was a freshman. And he started on um, point guard for him. Um, and he's nasty. You know, it's don't don't feel like you got left out. There's just so much talent in that conference, you know. And they all got good tape, but I really enjoyed watching y'all tape. You know, it was really good. Yeah, I think the kid advanced you're talking about is Trey Green. Yes, so, that's his name. Yeah, yeah, that kid, he's gonna be dangerous. And you know, they got a lot of money to pass around. Q don't we until y'all come to West Shaw, you ain't gonna be passing that bill around too much. Now I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna throw out a couple names that I saw and just going back and looking. Um second to thought on Mikhail Baldwin. Um, I noticed him two years – I think it's two years ago at um, the WEA, WEA camp that was at West mm-hmm. Charlotte and named him one of the top performers. Oh, my goodness. Dynamic out of the slot, man. Runs smooth, great routes. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he's a guy that I think would be great in the jet sweep game, getting him the ball on the screens um, and just letting him go to work in space. Um, DeMonte Furman at Mallard Creek. Another slot guy, um, you know, he was having heard a good halfway through the year. Then he missed oh, like, he yeah, yeah, he's good now though. He's good he now. Is. He was one of our first interviews this off season. Um, just another dynamic slot guy. A kid I just saw at the Carolina Experience Camp, and a lot of coaches reached out and said this kid, you know, could have been on was Tyler Hoff over at Huff. Um, I tell you, man. Um, he can run the full route tree. He's got mm-hmm. speed. Um, he's got enough physical ability to get off at the line of scrimmage. Um, another really good kid. And then um, AJ Davis Ingram at Mallet yes. Creek. I'm going to tell you, Mallet Creek has some dogs at the receiver position. And he did a lot of work out of the slot last year. Uh, very strong, uh, really good hands. He has enough speed to get it done. Uh, he reminds me of a possession type receiver that if he needs a first down, you're going to throw the ball in his direction and he's going to get it done. He ran a lot of in breaking routes. And then he put him on the outside, he ran a lot of curls and comebacks. Um, another really good player. I think 5'11, 175. Tough. He comes come from a good family. You know, that Ingram last name, whole lot of weight. You know, <laughs> you know I know a lot about him because I played with a great one a little bit. And oh, before you, before you go, can you please um post on here what Deshaun Baker just said? Yeah, I was waiting on it almost to finish that topic. This is this is what my these are the type of people I have as friends, and he's so <laughs> humble, and that's one of the best offensive minded people in the Durham State of North Carolina. Y'all keep on sleeping on Baker, and you're lying. You got about seventy five receivers over there. Good gracious, boy. <laughs> All right, so we've talked about the pretty boys. Now it's time to get ugly and nasty. And when we told Coach McClamrock he was going to do the lineman, man, he got excited. Now I know he's ready to talk about the big boys. All right. Yeah, I'll tell you what, man. Y- y'all can talk about the pretty boys all you want to. The dudes that wear their pretty little gloves and the little wristbands, and they got the little shields, and they got the smoke shields for pregame, and they got their towels and all their shirts all right, and all that bull job. I'm going to talk about dudes that's going to win the football games for you. The guys who are down in the trenches getting made. You know, Pat, man, I coached in, uh, at, at North Mac for seven years when I first started. And so it was really cool to get back and see these guys. I've, I've been able to watch a couple of them play live in the playoffs when our team ended. Uh, but it was really cool to watch some of these guys' films. Uh, I'm going to start with the offensive line. The first one that we're going to talk about is a, a big offensive tackle from Mallard Creek, uh, Jared Crawl uh, Bay. And if I mispronounce your name, sorry, guys, man, I'm, I'm in Cabarrus County. But, you know, he's your prototypical Mallard Creek kid, man. He's six foot five. He's 240 pounds. He's got long arms, you know. Honestly, I probably see him more as a defensive end. He's got some film as, as a defensive end as well. But I, I, I like the way he, he gets after it. I like the way he moves. I like the way he bends. Um, another kid coming out of North Mech. And once again, sorry, guys, if I butcher your name, you know who you are. Just just tell me how to pronounce it, the ticker, and I'll, I'll say it correctly. Uh, but out of North Mech, we got a big uh, a dude named Daniel Ohada, I believe it is. He's six foot two. He's 270 pounds. Man, I love the way that he keeps his feet moving when he's making his blocks, 
um, at Lake Norman. I'll tell you what, man, Lake Norman, uh, I don't know if Coach Fitz is the offensive line coach over there or not, but Lake Norman has got some offensive linemen, and, and I would love to uh, be able to coach those guys because they got some big old boys that they, they, they work together well. But the first one is Luke uh, Broswell, I believe it is. He's, you know, he's a kid that honestly it kind of warmed my heart to see some of these dudes because I think of Charlotte football and I think of all these big giant dudes that I've seen in years past, but it warms my heart to see somebody that's five foot 10, 250 pounds because that, that's what we play with at the 3A level. A lot of five foot 10 guys. And if you're 250, you're, you're a big offensive guard for us. But I thought that Luke was was extremely physical. I love the way that he kept a wide base whenever he engaged in his blocks. Thought that he did some really nice things. Um, another big old guy, when I say big, I mean, I'm talking about Mammoth. I reached out to his offensive line coach, uh, Coach Mayo from over there in Mooresville. And by the way, Coach Phillips, just so you know, man, I don't just hate on you, but I was undefeated at Pop Stadium. 1997, I was a player. The only game I ever played there, coach there. We beat him in the first round of the playoffs, went on to beat Hickory, who was the defending state champions the next week after that, and ended up running into a, a, a tough Kannapolis team that, that won the state championship that year. But uh, they've got this big offensive lineman. His name is Ridge Swartz. But he is six foot seven, 285 pounds. And so I reached out to Coach Mayo. Coach, is this joker really as big as what – this thing says, and he sent me a picture of him, and he's standing in the doorway, and the dude's head is like touching the ceiling. His shoulders are broader than the doorway itself. I ain't never seen a joker so big. Uh, a ginormous guy, man. Can't wait to see what he can do. But then I thought that the cream of the second team offensive line was a guard out of Vance, Tremaine Drakeford. He's six foot. 235 pounds. Once again, man, shout out to the guys who aren't six foot five because it's guys like Tremaine Drakeford that make high school offensive linemen, uh, offensive line so great. These are the guys that really run the engine of the ship that gets things moving, man. There's hope for a little guy. You don't have to be six foot four. But let me tell you, this, this joker blocks in space. His highlight was filled with him blocking in space versus smaller, lighter, quicker defensive backs. And when I say blocking them, I ain't talking about just getting in their way. Like, I'm talking about delivering the wood, knocking their, their jock strap in the dirt, man. Their nose is bubbling up, snot. Man, I love the way this dude plays. This is what makes high school offensive linemen so great. So, Tremaine, man, if you're out there listening – Man, what a play. I love the way you sell out. I love the way that you get after it. I think that you made uh, your offense a whole lot better. And my guess is you're probably a big reason that you guys were able to make that run late in the season, getting to the big boys and the first team offensive line over at Huff. You know, obviously, man, they, they've had a, a slew of guys come through. You know, typically when I think of offensive linemen in this league, I think about Mallow Creek, but Huff has a couple of them advanced. Obviously, the first one is Tim Artis Jr. Over at Huff, six foot four, two hundred and ninety pounds, and eighteen years of coaching. I don't know if I've coached three guys that were six foot four or not. Man, blessed to to have that type of size. It looks like he's got a couple of offers. Uh, Alabama A and M. I saw uh, plays multiple positions. He plays tackle. He plays right guard. He plays left guard on film. You know, just bone crushing pull blocks when they run GT counter and some other pulling schemes where he is just demolishing kids. I mean, for three and a half minutes of his highlight, it was nothing but him pinning and knockdowning kids. I mean, just an incredible job uh, that he does over there. He finishes his blocks. He bends great. Um, you know, I think that he is a legit college offensive lineman at the next level, and, and he's poised to have a great season this year. Um, another big offensive tackle, of course, a kid that, that I've seen a lot of pub about um, is the Cannon kid at Vance. He's six foot five. He's 240 pounds. And, you know, the thing is, he's so long, he doesn't look like he's six, you know, 240 pounds. So I, I reached out to Coach Lashman. Is this dude really six foot four? That's what I thought he was, 240 pounds. He goes, Coach, man, he's six foot five. And if you think he's big, you should see what his dad is. His dad is big and even more jacked up than he is. This dude has got unlimited potential, man. I mean, I think he's still raw as an offensive tackle. Uh, but with his with his length, with his wingspan, with his feet, um, 
I, I think his potential is through the roof. And I think his potential is through the roof at a couple different positions. I think he can play offensive tackle at the next level. If he if he puts on weight, I think he can play defensive end at the next level. And I think that if he stays at the size he is, I think that he can play uh, tight end if he can catch the ball at all because this joker is that big. He's that physical. He bends extremely well. Uh, was really, really impressed with his athleticism. Um, another kid coming out of Lake Norman, we got Peyton Davis. Six foot two, 290 pounds, and he makes up half of the Lake Norman right side. And let me tell you, Coach Oliphant, man, you've got a great problem over there. I mean, I got two studs at right guard and right tackle. You know, you got to make a decision coming up. Do you keep them both on the same side and just have a hellacious line, or do you divide them and put them on opposite sides? That was always something I, I struggled with uh, when trying to come up with where we want our guys to be. But but Davis, he, he stays low. He, he plays with a solid base, just like we talked about with Coach, uh, Coach Fitz, uh, with the other guy, um, super, super good at pass pro. Um, he strains to finish. Um, he's got great intensity. Man, I really like watching Peyton Davis's film. Uh, another guy over at Hoff, you know, Pep, you make these kind of lists, man, and it gets tough because what you really see on the offensive line are the tackles. And so you become tackle heavy on these kind of preseason lists and you kind of forget about the center. So centers in the IMAC, man, do your thing this year, get on the list. But Grayson um, uh, Hutchins, I believe is how you say his name, uh, six foot six, 290 pounds. Like I'm trying to imagine Coach Jenkins yelling at his offensive line. He's looking at their belly button and his voice starts screeching even higher and higher. And you know, just look at their belly button and they just kind of push that on his head and say, all right, Coach, we'll go and do it because I know how Coach Jenkins gets, especially at halftime. But, you know, this Hutchins kid, he's extremely patient uh, setting up his blocks. I think he comes off blocks well and works to the second level. Uh, uh, whenever it's a double team situation, he's got extremely long arms to be six, six, but his wingspan looks even longer than that. Um, I think that if he becomes more physical in the run game, I think that he can really be a dynamic player. He's got a couple of offers as well. Campbell and Southeast uh, Missouri state. Of course the candy kid, I missed his offers. A uh, and T Liberty, Charlotte um, coastal. I think Georgia Southern or Georgia state had offered him as well. Uh, 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 Makes total sense to me. But then the daddy that really shined to me, I think it was kind of the jewel of, of the group, a kid that I was really, really impressed with is Jake Johnson, man, from Lake Norman. He's six foot four, he's 285 pounds, and he might have been my favorite player to watch on film. Um, he's got offers from Bryant, from Butler, from Gardner Webb, from I think Charleston Southern, or, or one of those schools that offer him as well. His, his Twitter account says he's got a 4.1 GPA, and I've heard Coach Fitz and Lake Norman talk about uh, uh, those GPAs that, that they have up there. But this joker finishes his blocks. Good night, man. He is violent. He is nasty. He is strong. Uh, I love him beside the Davis kid who I mentioned earlier, the right guard. Uh, they really just solidify that right side. And I'll tell you, as, as a defense, man, it's really tough whenever a team can just say, we're going to run to the right side and there's nothing – you could do about it. I would like to see him in pass pro a little bit more um, than what he's shown on film. Like I said, he's a, he's a heck of a road grade offensive lineman in the run game. Um, but these kids have some, some tremendous, tremendous ability. Man, I think your future is on uh, NFL Live, Coach. Well, good, because I need a job, man. I'm just teaching now, and I think I'm going to get over pretty quickly. So. <laughs> That's what I got you for, man. Hey, Coach Bills, I don't know shit about not getting paid, man. That man pays me good to be on this show. Oh, well, Charlotte Communication pays me well, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> man, uh, some offensive linemen we also want to recognize. Javon Tate advanced. My goodness. Um, my, I think he's 6'3", 260 is what I think I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, physical. Physical in the run game, great technician, great feet in the pass game. Um, can kick slide, stay in front of his man well, um, playing a tackle position. Uh, yeah. I believe Bill told me the advanced coaches said he was the uh, the big offensive lineman that that they uh, really the want. Most, to like the most there. consistent, the yeah. most consistent offensive lineman. That mm -hmm. was um, Coach Last told me. He said yeah. I'd be crazy not to mention his name. I said okay. Yeah, and I'll tell you, Tremaine Drakeford, uh, you know, I, Coach McClamrock, I agree, man. Seeing him in space and pulling and getting to the second level and, 
Yeah, it was really impressive. It reminds, I, mean, I would love to see Tremaine on the sideline after one of those bone crushing hits after they score a touchdown because he just looks like the kind of kid that I just want to run up and just just punch as hard as I can in the chest and both of us go. Of course, he'd probably knock me backwards, but he just looks like the kind of kid. <laughs> his intensity, man, I would love to 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 see that on the sideline because that kid's a baller, man. Yeah, yeah. Y'all quit letting y'all quit letting Ken lie to you talking about them during linemen he got at, at um. <laughs> them joking bait might be on the side, but them things are mean. But you know, I'll tell you something. Oh. One of the big differences between 4A, especially these big four double A schools, and 3A is the size of the linemen. The linemen are what makes the difference. The linemen and the quarterbacks, I mean, athletically at, at Central Cabarrus, my guys could compete versus anybody in the state, I felt. Where we struggled is we just lacked in size up front. You know, I mean, numbers. 200 pound guys could play tackle for us at Central Cabarrus, and our depth was so limited. And we had small, I mean, our starting nose guard, who was an East West game, who's going on to play um, collegially, he weighed 163 pounds. He was five foot nine inches tall. You mm-hmm. know, and he was our nose guard. He was a heck of a player for us. But, you know, we wouldn't be able to do that at the next level, not in the 4 8 ball, not, yeah. not. An entire well, season, we might well, hold up now because you you about to talk about a nose tackle from um Vance Land and he ain't no big joker and Pep no. know what I'm talking about. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That, all he do is bear crawl, make pals, and and cause chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> right, so for a couple of the offensive line, I want to talk about uh, Bryce Boyd at Mallard Creek. Uh, yeah, big kid, six, yeah, three hundred pounds. Um, I expect him to come on the scene and, and be a big factor on that offensive line over there at uh, Mallard Creek. Right, and Jordan, then, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He did a lot of work um, in the camps and everything, and I like I like the way he's been growing. Um, and then Justin Fain, coach at West Charlotte, um, he actually, uh, you know, tagged me today <laughs> on Twitter. And he used it as a motivational thing, and I love that. I love that. He was, you know, another one that was just, you know, I mean, he he deserved, you know, six four two. I think two eighty, um, offensive and defensive lineman. Um, I was in. I, I like this film. I like this film. I think he's gonna have a good season. Yeah, you know, Coach, Coach, Coach West Coach Charlotte Bill knows this way better than I do. But my experiences with West Charlotte guys over the years, and granted, it's been a while. Is they always had such big athletic offensive linemen. Mm-hmm. You know, they were big and they were strong and they were physical, but they moved well as well. So yeah. it'll be really interesting to see, uh, you know, how they work out in Coach Griner's offense with him doing what he does and, and some of these big old boys. Yeah, we got we got a pretty good offensive line coach over there. I'm not going to spill the beans on that, but uh, we we're going. I'm very curious to see what the big boys don't do. We got a lot of athlete. Athletic big men over there, just like most people and I met do. Right? Shoot, there's okay. some at North Met that we even really mentioned because it, you know, it just it does so much talent. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, everybody there. I'll be biased, but it's just so much talent over there, like in the conference period. Like you love mm-hmm. what Lake Norman does. The, that pancake boy, Coach Austin got some boys up there, boy. Yeah, <laughs> And Morrisville, too, Coach Nixon, I was just talking to him. My dear, he's a good guy. I like him. But Morrisville, you don't get mean. They don't. They can run the ball at you all day. And Huff can, too. You know, it just it's – Yeah, that's, lines. that's one of the things that impressed me about these Lake Norman kids. When you think of Lake Norman, you think run, 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 run. But when they finally drop back through that play-action pass, yeah. their offensive linemen are very technically sound whenever they pass protect, man. Yes. Coach Fitz, I think, is the offensive line coach. Um, yeah. Does a tremendous job with those guys, and of course, you, you just mentioned Coach Nixon. Y'all better gear up for power and, and eighty different ways to run counter, man, because he's going to run, run GT and GY and, and every other way. I mean, uh, power. Strap, from, you, strap, from it, up. strap uh, it up. He'll do just a little bit of passing game to keep you honest, but uh, it's going to be fun to watch his offense play in that league, especially with the physicality of that league and the size of that league. If, if he can get the guys. You know, I mean, they've had what three offenses in three years now, really. You had Coach Helms a couple of years ago. You had um, um, uh, the coach that just left. You know, that bad, kind of bad, um, had, uh, that crazy offense that he ran, and now you're going to a more traditional 
line it up and let's just pound the guys. And <laughs> uh, you can't say three yards in a cloud of dust over there, three yards in a, a face full of, of black pebbles from the turf, I guess. You got to you know. play. <laughs> play ball. And then, you know, even with late at North Met, they hired a running back coach at the head coach. And he comes from – um. He, came, he was at Mooresville. He he was yep. at Mooresville. Yep. So you already know what they don't do. <laughs> it's just it don't be. Well, I mean, let's not forget their new defensive coordinator as well as Daryl Vereen, buddy. He's one of the all-time great running backs. Yes. No, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in the let me tell you, the things that he did when we were there, we're talking about ten and a half men box. It didn't matter. We we're running counter right at him. Yeah. So okay. you already know what's coming. You, it, I think you don't have to strap your, your chin straps up every Friday because yeah. even with Sam being uh, West Shaw, we know they, everybody know we don't run that ball, baby. Mm -hmm. And you now you, <laughs> you just gotta be ready. Yeah, you know, and that's 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 the advantage I think you guys have as well. The offensive linemen, the quarterbacks, but then the big thing that's important for y'all is the depth that y'all need. Mm -hmm. When you're playing that league and guys are just pounding on you and pounding on you, and pounding, you better have a guy that can step up when a guy rolls his ankle or goes down. Yeah. Because it's so physical. Dudes get banged up, man. I know that I imagine that coaches in Charlotte coach a little bit differently in practice than, than maybe 3A schools or 2A schools do because, mm -hmm. because of that pounding that you take. Um, but, but it should be an interesting year in the back in football. Oh, yeah. All right. So defensive linemen, uh, Coach McClamrock has those as well. So we gave him all the big boys. What you got on D-line, Coach? Let me tell you, buddy. They may not be super big in size, like that big kid Mallory Creek had a couple years ago that went down to Georgia. But some of these jokers, let me tell you, I do. I just bragged about the offensive line, but I don't want to play offensive tackle. I don't want to play quarterback in the IMAC this year because there are some defensive ends and defensive linemen that are coming to get it. Of course, everybody knows out at Huff, they got a 22 kid. I think it's the the first underclassman that I've mentioned, the Curtis Neal kid. He's he's six foot two. He's 300 plus pounds. Um, you know, when he was in the eighth grade. Coach Jenkins called me up and said, man, I've got a kid that's going to be one of the top players I've ever coached, and i got dudes in the league, and, and, and he's going to be as good as any of them. Uh, you know, I think they had to buy new jerseys to fit him because he was so big as a freshman. Uh, but he's a four-star. He's got offers from everybody, I mean, Oregon and, and, and Alabama and fill in the blank if you've heard of him. They've offered him. You know, what makes him so special at 300 pounds is he is so quick off the ball. You know, he's really Aaron McDonald at the high school level. You know, he beats you with so many moves, his little club swim. I mean, even threw in a couple of a couple of, of, of spin moves on his highlight film, and I'm watching it knowing, knowing Coach Jenkins, thinking to myself, the first time Jenkins saw him do that, there's no way Jenkins didn't cuss him out because he just didn't allow that kind of stuff when I knew him. But he's so quick off the line. He's got so many different ways to beat you, so many different moves. Um, he beats double teams. you got to double team them, which now frees up your linebackers and puts your defensive end on an island by himself. Uh, you know, what a dominant force he is inside, and there are still two more years for him to play. I've also seen some things where, where he's kind of standing up for some stuff that needs to be stood up on uh, for on social media, uh, which is pretty neat to see a young person, especially, you know, a 22 kid, do that kind of stuff. Um, another kid at North Mech, speaking of defensive ends, man, I mean, there, there are three defensive ends that can just fly in this league. Uh, Renoy Somerset at North Mech. He's six foot three, 230 pounds is what it says. He's got offers. Uh, in fact, I think he's an Akron commit. Um, so Coach Cook, he, he grabbed a good one from North Mech up there at Akron. Uh, but he is fast. He is explosive. Uh, in fact, on his highlights, he, he gets an interception, so he can kind of do it all. You know, he's an extremely raw player right now, um, but he's super long. He's super athletic. And, you know, hopefully uh, those guys at North this year can continue to grow him as a as a player, uh, teach him some different moves and, and to do some different things, because I think the sky is the limit for this kid. Um, another kid um, at Mooresville we talked about, and if I, if I put your name, big guy, sorry, buddy, Zaheer barnes Va. Um, at Mooresville, he's six foot, 235 pounds. Once again, these defensive linemen aren't, aren't monsters in size, but this kid plays defensive end. He plays defensive tackle. He plays offensive guard for him on the offensive line as well. Uh, uh, good burst, uh, super aggressive. Um, 
uh, uh, when he's on the offensive line, he's another one of those guys that blocks well in space. You know, Pep, I even may think that that Zaire is a better offensive lineman than he is defensive end. That's saying a lot because he's a pretty stinking good defensive end. Uh, but then the kid that really impressed me with this first group, and I know I did second group first the last time, uh, but out at Huff, Isaac Walker, um, who I believe is a Georgia Southern commit. He's six foot two. He's two hundred twenty five pounds. Um, you know, he he is just an incredible player. Uh, from from what I understand, uh, he's a, he's another transfer to Huff. He, he was a, he was a, a wide receiver, I believe, at Page. Um, that they talked him into playing defensive line, and you know, he, he fits the mold of of what Jenkins likes in his defensive lineman. These these big long guys that you see in the IMAC, especially, but guys are super athletic and guys that can disrupt the quarterback and make him step up and, and get in his throw lanes, all that kind of stuff. Um, he's a three-star guy. He is extremely explosive. He brings on every single play. Uh, but what impressed me the most, especially because he's a wide receiver, is how disciplined he was in his highlight film. Uh, he may not play disciplined all the time, but in highlights, he was extremely disciplined. Uh, really loved watching Isaac Walker's film. And then with the second team, once again, man, there are some dudes in, 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 this, as, in this as well. Uh, over there at the West Charlotte, man, the Dub C, what, what? Uh, you got the DeBose kid, uh, Demaha, Demaja, maybe is how his first name, but he's six foot one. He's 250 pounds. He plays nose guard, but at six one two fifty five, 255, uh, for me, it sounds crazy to say this, but he plays bigger than what his size actually is. Um, once again, he's very raw, man. I'm sure that the coach Griner and whoever the defensive line coach over there is going to get a hold of him and they're going to fine tune some things and he's going to be a, just a heck of a football player. He's got a great motor. He sheds blocks. Well, I, I really love the way um, offensive linemen struggled to block him one-on-one watched him. Uh, then Mallard Creek's got another big uh, defensive lineman, a nose guard type. Uh, Braylon Dixon is his name. He's six foot, 250 pounds. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a thick, strong kid, man. He's, he's what you see in Charlotte football. He's got a good motor, um, uh, a good, solid bull rush. He's got heavy hands, um, still very raw. I, I would like to see him grow in his repertoire of moves that he has to beat offensive linemen. I think once he does that, he can really become a dynamic force in this league uh, because of the way that he plays. Um, a, a kid from Mooresville, uh, Fred Brown. I think Coach Nixon mentioned his name uh, earlier. Uh, another kid, man. Shout out for for the guys who aren't six foot five. He's five foot ten. He's two hundred twenty five pounds. These, these are the kind of guys that we see every single week in three A ball. Um, you know, uh, super. Uh, uh, I can't read my my notes here, but I remember his highlight started off with him getting a strip six sack. For the touchdown, I don't even know who it was against. Super explosive, good film. He plays some defensive tackle. He plays some defensive end form as well. It'll be interesting to see what Coach Nixon does with that defense and where he ends up putting them. If Coach Nixon kind of stays with what he's done in the past on defense or if he tries something else moving into this league. And then I thought the crown jewel of the second team defensive line, uh, another kid from Huff, Julian uh, Rollins. He's six foot two. He's 220 pounds. He's got some um, – uh, offers from Notre Dame College, which is one of the top Division II programs in the country. Valpo has offered him. Um, Davidson has offered him. So that tells you a little bit about, about what kind of young person he is, what kind of grades he has, because Davidson just doesn't offer people. Uh, his, his highlight film starts off versus Richmond County with him knocking a ball uh, to himself for an interception, which is pretty incredible. But his highlight film, you know, it's one thing when you have uh, highlight after highlight after highlight versus – bad football teams or we see kids who have highlight after highlight versus maybe good football teams, but it's fourth quarter mop up play and the other teams got their seconds or thirds in, but this dude's highlight is filled with just incredible plays uh, versus Richmond County and versus Vance. So I know he was playing against some of the top competition in the state. He's got multiple pass breakups from the line of scrimmage. He just seems quarterbacks always had to know where he was and when you knock down a quarterback's ball, not only does that make the offensive lineman start second guessing how he's going to attack them, but it gets in your quarterback's head as well. And not only is it getting the quarterback's head, but now those wide receivers who have worked so hard, like what Coach Phillips was just talking about, all their moves. And man, the, the wide receivers today in 2020 are so much farther advanced than where they were even just 10 years ago with 
the skill set that they bring to the table every single play. But it gets those wide receivers so frustrated because now they're working hard to get open, and then some big joker up front knocks the ball down. Man, it's just it's just it's just demoralizing completely. Um, you know, I really think that if he wasn't in the IMEC, that Julian Rollins may be the best defensive end in almost every single conference in the state. I mean, I, mean, I think he's that good. Um, he's an incredible player. Um, you know, he runs very well. Uh, he's got a great motor. I uh, was really, 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 really excited to see what I saw on film from Rollins as well. I'm going to tell you right now, there are 27 people watching Oh, now 28. Thank you. Uh, well, we're back down 27. Anyway, <laughs> if you're watching this right now, number one, thank you. <laughs> number two, you are a football junkie because we just talked about offensive line and defensive line, and Coach McClamrock went into depth that I have not heard on a high school football level ever. <laughs> I mean that that was incredible stuff. Um, a couple of guys I want to um, highlight: Caleb Bearden, a name that most people probably don't know. He's a transfer in advance from Savannah, Georgia. Um, I had two coaches reach out to me about this kid and say, "Hey, check him out." I checked him out. He's going to be an impact player um, for that team. Um, like you said, coach, for some of the other guys, he's about six foot, 225, 230, but really good defensive end off the edge, uh, really good pass rush, uh, can hold up in the run game. Uh, that's the name you want to look out for. Another kid advanced, James Pierce, um, kid that does not see got the spotlight. He was a kid I wanted to interview. I was trying to find his social media and, um, Carlos Richardson um, texted me his number and said, Coach, he ain't on there. <laughs> That's the best way to reach him. And uh, we're going to reach out to him. But 6'5", um, he played a little bit of receiver. But, um, you know, he's going to be a big-time defensive end. Um, pretty much they expect him to fill in for uh, Steven Sings, you know, who graduated uh, last season and was a dynamic player off the edge for him. Um, Elijah Simmons, Coach Billups. West Charlotte, um, another lineman that um, I thought had some some good plays on the inside, uh, more of an interior defensive tackle, um, gets after it pretty well up front. And then um, I interviewed this kid, um, I think last year when I visited Lake Norman, and um, I'm going to coach Oliphant telling me that this was a kid to watch because he's going to grow um, into something big. And it's Maurice Morris at the defensive tackle position, strong kid, I saw a video today. He was bench pressing 315, I believe, like it was nothing. Um, just a, a big, big, strong kid up in the middle of that Lake Norman defense. Um, Coach Bill, is there anybody else you think on the defensive line? Not like the – like I said, it's hard, man. It's like you watch Creek. Creek got a bunch of good ones coming up, you know. But, you know, it's, I saw I saw a tweet. That people were shot that we didn't have a bunch of them. Their players play multiple positions. Yeah. Yeah. All over the place on their defense. And you it's really hard to see where they go. I think I forgot one of the kids now. I think last name Brown or something like that. I think you already got that's the one you had. I forgot the kid name, but I watched him work out and he's like a DN um linebacker. <laughs> then I saw the one the, the offensive lineman you speak of. He's an athlete. I saw him playing running back. He plays running back, yeah. <laughs> offensive you know, tackle, defensive tackle. Playing and all over like, the field. It's like if you play defensive line, you're going to play running back for him a little bit as well. You know, I think what a lot of people don't understand, yeah, he, um, players and parents especially, is at the 3A level, the 2A level, the 1A level, you've got these really, really good quarterbacks for example, who throw for a lot of yards mm -hmm. and, and they do really nice things on film. But what it's tough to realize is that the defensive ends in the IMEC are so much faster, so much longer. The, 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 the speed, I mean, it's not unusual for a defensive end in the IMEC to be 225, 230, 240 and run a 4 5 four, six. 
and real talk, I mean, this is me, man. I, I love 3A football. I coach 4A football. Uh, but we got a lot of DBs at the 3A level running four fives and four sixes. And that's a good DB for us. And when you got a six yeah. foot two, six foot three, 220, 235 pound defensive end coming at a quarterback that runs a four five, what the quarterback is able to do staying in the pocket and then beating those DBs is so much more impressive than when you see it at the smaller mm -hmm. levels. And that's not a knock because I've worked hard to get my kids into college. But, you know, a lot of times you, you hear parents and, man, that kid at, you know, fill in the blank, Mallard Creek or wherever, they don't have the yardage that my boy has. Why is he getting the scholarships? Mm -hmm. The talent level is better. At the end of the day, it, it just is. And that's not a knock on 3A because no, no. You're, it's, it's all relative. It's all relative. Yeah. Like, like you mean the Vance kid you was talking about, the kid who played wide receiver, and now he's gonna play DN, the lone kid. Yeah, I, we saw him at Richmond County. He went in there for y'all. Just don't know how good Stephen Sing really were. And you really not. He played at one, a three, a five, a seven. He was all everywhere. When they used to put Sing at a three, they'll bring this big lanky kid in. And I'm yeah. saying, who, who is this kid? Yeah, and. He's long. When you play the end, you're long. You got the long arms. You de you're dangerous. <laughs> you're, that you're, you're unblockable. And he was coming off that. It, Vance, Vance, it just Vance has so much talent on that. That D line don't get a lot of respect that it should. And that D line was even amazing. Pow, I know they got Powell. Powell's one of the greatest linebackers to play in the state of North Carolina. But I tell you what, that D line, <laughs> that D line, dangerous and like. The little short nose tack when he coming in, I love him. I don't know that kid name, but that boy. Jalen Andrews, I'm getting ready to talk about him in just a second. He get a four point stand and he go get it. <laughs> Coach uh, Harris, talk about this kid, Coach Bill. It's Angelo McLaurin. Angelo, I hear great things about him. He's um he's underrated. There, we're really um expecting a lot from him because we're going to do the three man front. Him, DeBose, and the other kid you was you mentioned there, mm -hmm. we got a lot. We got a lot right on. Angelo's gonna be pretty darn good. Um, I watched his film. Um, Coach Harris told me a lot about him. Um, Coach Grind, you know, we we love the big boys at, at West Charlotte. So we got um because DeBose is asking not on play. He's on. We you know everybody know we don't go to the three man front. So you know they don't be the ends and <laughs> bring your popcorn. Six three thirty thirty. Yes, bring your popcorn. <laughs> All right, so I got the linebackers in the two specialty positions. I'm gonna run through those guys here. All right, we're gonna get through the obvious, of course. Um, <laughs> Power Eccles, like you said, um, Coach Billups, best linebacker that we've seen around here, and God knows how long. Um, Great young man um, off the field. Um, obviously, he making a statement with the um, uh, foundation that he put together um, to address uh, racial and social injustice. Um, that just tells you all you need to know about that kid right there. On the field, the emotional leader of that defense led them to a state title uh, last season. Physical player, big hitter. Um, he makes plays in the run game, obviously. He, he comes on a mic blitz like he did against Richmond County that I think changed the whole dynamic of the football game. Um, it was a big highlight that we put out. Um, um, just uh, And a, a wonderful young man to talk to. Interviewed him the last three years. I remember uh, Coach Aaron Brand, when I came over there two years ago, and Power was a sophomore before he was known. And he said, Matt, this, this guy is going to be the biggest thing around Charlotte um, that we've had in a long time. And when I talked to him that day, I said, there's something special about this kid. Um, we put that interview out and, you know, people are reaching out and saying, man, there's just something about this kid, his presence and the way he speaks with confidence. And he looks you in the eye and he's yes, sir, no, sir. And, you know, he talked about how he was an old school player and, you know, all that stuff is true. Um, and he's going to Carolina, of course. The sky's the limit for him. I think we're going to end up seeing him play on Sundays. Um, just a wonderful, wonderful man, uh, young man to cover these past few years. And um, it's just, just a pleasure to to know him. 
Um, Casey Seegers um, at Huff. Um, you know, he was at R.G. Kell. Um, I interviewed him last year when he was at R.G. Kell. He's a Texas A&M commit, uh, outside linebacker. Um, vicious, vicious coming off the edge. Um, you know, in the pass rush game, he's very physical. Um, R.G. Kell used him last year in the run game uh, as a kind of a power back. He gave them a swag and an attitude that you didn't normally see, you know, in the R.G. Kell team in the past. Um um, he is a well-spoken young man also. Um, you know, his confidence, you know, is high. Um, you know, he's going to Texas a and for a reason. He's a physical talent, um, just a, a great, great player um, that is going to, to be a huge impact on the next level. Uh, Chris Williams at Hopewell, Coach Bird talked about him earlier. Another kid that doesn't seek out the spotlight necessarily. Two-time all-conference player, inside linebacker for a uh, Hopewell. Um, you know, they don't have they, – they had big Vashon Lawrence last year to help protect him a little bit at the nose tackle position. Uh, he's able to, you know, really shed block well, make plays in the run game especially. I think that was his strength. Um, and then, you know, being a team leader. Um, but, but once again, a, a, a yes sir, no sir kid that just, you know, grinds and gets the job done. Uh, Miles Jones, you know, at Huff, you know, a, a really, really kind of three, four outside backer, pass rush type guy. Um, one of the best um, pass rushers in the city of Charlotte, in my opinion. Um, we highlighted him last year when he was at Myers Park. Um, another, you know, well spoken kid. I remember we highlighted him and we went to cover the game. And he sought me out in the parking lot after the game to say thank you. And that tells you the kind of kid he is. Um, comes from a good family. I've uh, talked with his father before. Um, he's committed. Um, uh, just a, a really, really talented player um, going at Huff defense. Uh, Caleb Tate uh, played at Lake Norman last year. Another um, good, tough inside linebacker. Uh, I think Coach McClamrock said this about uh, the Providence kid before he plays with a lot of piss and vinegar. Um, that's, <laughs> that's what reminds me of, of just watching his film. Just tough, tough, um, good tackler. Uh, you know, can tackle in space, can shed blocks on the inside run game and make plays. I um, mean, you can tell he was a leader for that team over at Mooresville. Um, Tanner Schmidt, um, Coach Billis, both me and you got excited about you know, watching this kid's film yesterday. Um, all conference last year, uh, I think he had 91 tackles with the total tackles. Um, I, I was so excited, I had to watch it again today. Uh, <laughs> just an, a, a throwback old school football player all over the field. Um, just um, a really, really uh, great linebacker uh, for Lake Norman. And then the two uh, special position kids, um, I hope I say this right, Shondell Slade. Is that right, Coach Billups? Yeah, Shondell, Shondell, yeah. All Don't right. get me. I'm terrible with names. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where to put this kid. I mean, he kind of played all over the front seven, and he played running back last year and, uh, you know, looked at his film. And, you know, he, he was really good coming off the edge. On, and then he played in the middle some and came on some Mike Blitzes and made plays. Uh, he tackled well in the face. Um, he just played all over the defense, kind of kind of like an Isaiah Simmons role, you know, at Clemson. Was, now, I'm not saying he's the same type of player. I'm just saying that's how they use them, just kind of all over the you defense. You say <laughs> Just all over the defense and making plays. And then um, I, call this, I call it a hybrid position, kind of a – you know, kind of like a strong safety slash outside backer. Will Kopachewski at Lake Norman interviewed this kid um, before in the past. Um, really, really good kid. Um, you know, look at his film. He's physical. He's not afraid of contact. Um, he'll come up and support in the run game. Uh, he's got the range to cover um, in the safety position if you're playing a, a two deep shell. Uh, he can get over the top on the deep ball. He can react, you know, to – you know, balls coming into his own well. He can make plays. I think he had three interceptions, and um, I think he led the conference from the DB position in tackles. Um, you know, another um, really good kid here. So, um, 
Well, the kids that I want to highlight, um, <laughs> and this kid, I tell you, I just saw him at the um, Carolina Experience Camp. Dylan Brady, a linebacker for Huff. I tell you, man, what a player! What a player! Um, he, I talked to a coach today, and they said that this kid could, um, you know, change the whole uh, dynamic of a defense. Um, that's high praise. And you look at his film, he's super athletic. He's got good size. Um, he's hungry. Uh, he wants to get the job done. Um, he, he's going to have an impact on the Huff defense for sure. Um, Coach Wilson, you mentioned Jalen Andrews. Um, interviewed him, uh, I believe, about two months ago. Um, he's, he told me he's going to move to more of a linebacker position. That's why I put him here on the positions that uh, talk about. But, you, you know, like you said, he got in that four-point stance, played that nose guard position. Um, and I tell you, he was a wrecker. He was a wrecker. Um, you you had to try to double-team him. And you look at his size, you're like, dang, oh, why can't you just call off the ball and, and road grade him? You can't because he's so quick. He's so quick. He's so tough. Um, and that allowed players like Power Eccles and Stephon Thompson – to flow and make plays from the linebacker position. And I know Coach Hackett had a lot of fun just sending them all on all kind of different, you know, blitzes because this guy was doing his job up front. And then uh, the last guy I want to highlight, Bradley Wilson at Lake Norman. Um, another kid, he played outside backer, but I love the way he tackled in space. Um, you know, some people, you face a Lake Norman team, you think, you know, you got the athletic ability on them. Um, this kid reminded me of, you know, kind of like a player you would see at Charlotte Catholic. He's very smart, uses his angles, um, tackles well in space, fundamentally sound, uh, just an overall good uh, player at the linebacker position. All right. Y'all think we missed anybody on that? Nope, because you you said my favorite linebacker out of all of them, that Tanner Smith, boy. Even though I don't like that, um, I'll often post that pick of him hitting my boy. <laughs> but hey, that dude, one play, they ran a running back screen. The <laughs> guard came pulling. He power cleaned the guard, went over and made the damn tackle on the screen. I said, Jesus. I threw, I was at work like, whoo. Yeah, it's something about, hey, late Norman got some, boy, they got some, they do. Boy, do not some snot out of your butt. They do. They absolutely do. All right, Coach, you got your favorite position at all. We saved the best for last. Them DBs, baby. Um, <laughs> let me tell you something. I work. I, I'll coach Chacha. I'll be the happiest man in America right now. This darn DB group he got. Um, kicking off, you know, you got Mario Love Jr. Man. Um, what can you not say about the kid? The kid been proving himself since he was a freshman. There. Um, tough. He got great. He got great feet. He played great man um, coverage, and he, he's mean, and I, I like him. He he has the swag he would want to have to play corner. He talks, boy. When I tell you that boy talk, that boy talks, and he backs up. You know, it just – he don't care. He I, You know, I know you see him get beat a lot every now and then, but it's the reason why he's going to NC State. Um, Braylon Oliver, I had to look this kid up. And my goodness, I don't know where he came from. I think from South Carolina, correct, Pep? Yes. Yes, that's correct. This kid, uh, it's the reason why he's going a little bit. He, he's he, he's going to hit you. He's going to smack you in the mouth. He's a ball hawk, too. You know, I all you saw him was doing, catching the ball, <laughs> pick six, pick six. And that's impressive in South Carolina. You know, it's. It's a lot of great football being played. He's no slouch. I think you really don't have the game plan from this um for this kid. Then you got the other <laughs> the other um, monster they got over there, um, Tyron Taylor. Um, th that kid, he probably one of the most unappreciated people in that secondary, along with Sean Brown. Um, them two, they <laughs> they could it's huff. You know, y'all, we all we don't get Coach Chachi his praise. That secondary is nasty, and they're mean. They, they all play with an attitude, and they're really awesome. Nice kid, like Sean Brown. He was—I I know Sean. Sean is one of the most polite kids, but on that football field, 
you don't you would not want to get hit by me. He, him and uh, Mr. Taylor, they're mean. Um, great football players. I, I it's a reason they're getting the looks that they want to. I think Sean is going to NC State as well. He deserve it. He 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 out. He's he's a big boy. He's mean. He'll hit. He the cover. You ask him. Um, Coach Baker told me he's one of his favorite players at um Huff, and that's saying a lot coming from Mr. Baker because he he like me. He speak his mind. <laughs> Um, then you got Chris uh, Shepard. I hope I said that right at Lake Norman. Oh my goodness, it just <laughs> this kid, man. Um, he fits the Lake Norman, you know. Lake Norman, they have all these athletes, these athletes that will smack you in the mouth. They're, they're not scared. None of these kids will back down. You know, you talk about that Vance game, you watch that game. My goodness, this kid was making plays all over the field. I, I love watching him play. Um, coach Allison, you're doing a great job. I think his father is the um, secondary coach um, over there at Lake Norman, if I'm correct. Um, this next guy, Nate Spindle, guys, <laughs> he was probably the third best DB on that team last year. And he really came in, in spurts, but this kid could cover. Um, Pep, remember at Richmond County, I was like, who is that kid? And you know, I had to go over there and ask Hacker in the middle of the game, who is the kid? He said, oh, what's the I said, good, great. He, he, he just, you know, we all talk about Lowry. Lowry is great, but this kid right here, he don't underestimate that Vance secondary. That secondary is going to be good. He's he's a ball player. I'm curious to see what they're going to do with him. I think, you know, that Lowry is going for that free safety. And, you know, you got – um. The cold kid. I don't want to mess it first. Now I don't know if he don't play that rover or that free, but I think he don't play that rover. They don't put Spindle at free. Probably I don't know. Don't not an inside. I don't talk. I don't talk football with everybody right now. I'm been focused on my own stuff. Um, <laughs> then you got Mr. John Anderson over there at Huff. He is not a. I can't. You know, you play DB at Huff, you got it. You know, it's Josh is one of the best DB coach. I don't really say that a lot about a lot of people. But, I really respect what he does in that secondary. Him, Hack, you know, Mr. All of it, what everybody, everybody and I met. It's a, it's a bunch of wonderful DB coaches. This next one, this this is my guy. Um, I Fred Bates. Um, when he was a freshman, he he played for me as freshman at Hopewell, and he used to drive me crazy. But the one thing I would tell you about Fred, he he is a dog. He'll run through a wall for you. Once you know he got your back, you got his back, he'll play his butt off. He always played with a chip on, so he's been like that since his freshman year at Hopewell. Um, he really won the, uh, the um, hidden gems in the IMAC. I was proud that he made all conference last year. He really deserved it. You know, they don't get a lot of praise over there. Um, some of my sleepers, I'm going to talk about two other Hopewell, some more Hopewell DBs. Um, Jabari Brown, <laughs> funny story about Jabari Brown. He probably don't get mad that I tell you this. He wanted to play quarterback his freshman year. I said, boy, you don't go in there and play um safety. You ain't gonna get no money no quarterback. Everybody can throw, but you you not that's not you. I remember we was laughing last year around this time. I said he started um getting a lot of recognition on um, DB. I said, hmm, I guess I was not the stupid coach uh, anymore, huh? Then we bust out laughing. But Jabari Brown, he's he don't go great day in that star position over there for um for Coach Bird. Um, major, major, major weathers. He played basketball for yes, Coach Bill did coach basketball in middle school. I'm probably the only middle school basketball coach ever to get ejected from a game, but it was not my fault. It was the ref's fault. He was too sensitive. Major Weathers is a dog. He's he's five, he's five feet nothing. But please let me tell you something. He's like a pit bull. He get a hold of you, he's not he. Hey, he don't stay on you. He's nasty. He's everything you want. He's very confident. He's a workhorse. Um, he always works on his craft. That's where he comes from. Um, to start in the IMAC as a freshman, even though it is at Hopewell, that's impressive. And you know, it, it takes a lot to break that kid pride, but you ain't don't break it. Um Trayvon Richardson, my boy Trayvon over there, um Hopewell. Um it was unfortunate, you know, his seeing that cut, but um Coach Bur Coach Burr is right. Trayvon is a hidden gem. He's very um he's smart. He's one of the smartest football players. He played, he started for his his freshman year. And then he asked us to go back down to uh, 
JV so he just get a little bit more experience, which was smart on his end. But you know, he you put him in there as a freshman. We had to play him early because we had an injury against AL Brown, and we had to play him early. And that's to say he grew up that year. <laughs> you know, you go in freshman year playing AL Brown, that's tough. Um, last but not least, on uh, my guy at West Shaw, um, Tony Harris Jr. Um for a sophomore, everything he did as a sophomore starting in that secondary, it just – the things I hear about him, um, he's smart. You know, he he's a dog. You know, I, I like his film. I like his tape. I think he's going to bring a lot of dynamic back there for us in the um, leadership in that secondary. And you need to be a leader to play that free safety role. And um, he could play corner. You know, he don't, he don't got a little growth spurt from what his dad told me. Um, and I'm, I know coach is looking real good for him this year. So I think he don't have a breakout year. Um, and everybody else, you know, Vance, you can never, you don't, I don't know all the players name at Vance, but even Creek, Creek got, um, it's a safety. I forgot his name, but they got a young guy over there who plays safety. He's pretty mean. He's going to be pretty good. It's, you just can't count nobody out. It's like, you know, even North, my guy um, is a DB coach over there at North, and I know he's doing great things. It just – it does so many names, you got to get lost in the sauce sometimes. But don't be mad. You know, Huff, they deserve it. Them, them kids are good. You know, it just it is what it is. Very, very good breakdown, Coach. Um, you know, obviously you know your DBs well here in the area. Um, a couple people I'm going to kind of expound on. Elijah Wilson at Morrisville um, interviewed yeah. him. Um, I'm going to tell you something. You know, I think he's a rising junior. Um, yes. He's on track to be uh, one of the better um, corners or DBs in that class. Just incredible athleticism, mm -hmm. um, great cover skills and man in zone. Uh, well, another well-spoken young man when I interviewed him, uh, was very impressed uh, with him uh, when I talked to him and looked at his film. Um I want to t shout out a few more kids here. Um, <laughs> it's funny, we go back to Huff, but I'll tell you, um, I, I talked to a, a coach because I, I, I looked at my one-on-one -on -one highlights that we put together, and I kept saying, who is this kid? Who is this kid? I found out who this kid was. And, he, uh, of course, he's a, a Chachi disciple. Um, Isaiah Brown Murray. Um you know, I, I I love, you know, the way he plays. And he's um, got a couple more years in his game. Very athletic. Great technique and man coverage, of course, mm -hmm. all ones. Very impressive. Uh, Corey Crump at the safety position. Um, good size kid. He's going to grow uh, even more. Uh, comes from a good family. Talked with his father um, a little bit when I was out at um, Blazing 7 on 7. Uh, a couple weeks back. I'm um, really impressed with him. Derek Spearman committed to Princeton uh, playing safety. 6'3", 195. Um, another Huff product. I uh, interviewed him. Another well-spoken kid. Obviously, you're going to Princeton. You're pretty smart. Um, you know, just an impressive kid all around. Tyreon Porter advanced. Um, undersized. Um, very talented um, I remember he made a play against Butler in the playoff. I think it was like a strip fumble. Um, he's always around the football, a uh, physical player, another talented kid. Jamil Muldrow, um, cornerback at Mallard Creek. Good size, uh, underclassman. I think he's like 6'1", 185. A uh, very talented kid. Um, Will Salter, I mean, I tell you, this kid was was all conference last year at the safety position. Once again, we mentioned Lake Norman. Uh, looked at his film. I tell you, man, it's just, this DB class is just so dang on talented. It's ridiculous. Um, physical player, not afraid of contact. Um, mm -hmm. Really, you know, does well in the run support game. Also has the ball skills, had a few interceptions uh, with a return. He's an emotional leader for that team. Um, just a really, really good kid. Hey, I saw I missed one because I saw the uh, parents say, I did not forget about Mr. Number 37, Mr. Eliza Wilson. That, <laughs> hey, when I see another 37, me being a number 37 myself, you know, I you already labeled it. I'm just sorry. I, my notes 
Coach Bill's right like a chicken. And uh, <laughs> now nah, he's he's um he's one of the heart and soul of that Morrisville defense. Like I said, it's just something about Morrisville and Lake Norman. You know, you love seeing what they they're doing now. That 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 is a mean. They're both two mean football programs. And him, he you you put him. He could play safety. He could play corner. He has all the, the skill set to play all over the field. I really like his film. I enjoy his film. I apologize. You, um, it was not on purpose. Coach Bill, no, I was, I was looking. I said, "Who is?" Oh, my bad. <laughs> but now nah, he's he's a dynamic football player. Great. great. Oh yeah, thirty seven. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. Good. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna take one on the chin. What about the kickers? You called me out. Kicker love. I love kickers. <laughs> kickers can help win you ball games. I know everyone can say assess to that as being a coach. Uh, we probably won games and lost games on the foot of a kicker. When I played my junior year at Hardy, we lost back-to-back -back games against Northwest Cabarrus and West Rowan on kickers making long field goals in the 90s. I mean, seriously? It was already bad enough that we got beat by Coach Bilton at West Charlotte all the dang old time. But then we lose on back to the field goals. I mean, come on, man. What in the world? All right. Kicker love. I love the place kicker we got on this team, Seth Howell, Mallard Creek. Really good size kid. Um, he's got a good, strong leg. He's got good accuracy. Um, I remember um, against uh, – Vance Lashley nailed a key field goal in that game. Um, you know, really good on the kickoffs. Um, you know, just a, a, what is everything you want in the kicker, man. Reliable, good leg, um, good accuracy. That's what you got to have in a kicker. Um, and he provides that for that Mallard Creek team. He's coming back. You know, it's going to be a senior year. Um, I think he's going to help that team, you know, put points on the board. Absolutely. And then um, at punter, Cole Maynard for um, Huff. I'm going to tell you something, man. When you see a punter um, punt the ball and it just hangs in the air and you're just watching it and it just keeps going up, it keeps going up, it keeps going up, and you know the kind of athletes Huff has that's coming down the field, that puts so much pressure on you as a punt returner to try to get something done. It helps in your field position game. Um, he's really, really good, you know, at that. And then at the pinning the ball um, inside the 10 and the five-yard line, he's really good at his directional punting. And he also kicked. He's not a bad kicker. Um, we highlighted him last year uh, before one of the games, and, you know, he was very appreciative of that. And, um, you know, punters are important too, so – Special teams, another third of the game, you know, can make a big impact. And I want to shout out, before we sign off, I want to shout out Cherie Glenn. She has been sitting in the background all this time when we have been talking about all these players. She's still here with us. So, Cherie, you got the last word tonight. Anything you want to say, you can say it. I'm good. I've been enjoying listening to you guys. It's, it's you know, it's cool hearing about all the different positions. I know about them, but, you know, to hear y'all's take on it, it's, it's really been awesome. I had to relocate, though, because there was a spider where I was, and I don't do spiders. So I definitely left the room, and I'm standing in the hallway. But, you know, it was cool. I, I enjoyed it. That's what CFI is all about. Dedication. It's a three-hour show. Three-plus hours. Don't say we don't love the kids. That's why we're here. I got to be at work at 6 a.m. and we're doing it for you. I hope you appreciate it. If you're not if you're not watching Football Focus Weekly, you ain't learning about high school sports around Charlotte. I can tell you that. All right. Absolutely. And there's still 20 people on watching right now. I know you love football. If we missed or if you missed us talking about your position, please. I took a never came back. You're terrible. You're terrible. You know, I ain't no say that because you're terrible. God damn, man. Boy, I'm, I'm so glad you have, I'm so glad you had a hump. I'm so glad you left Huff. I'm so glad you left Huff and went to Morrisville. And I hope Coach Nixon don't let you coach football. You know who I'm talking to. Do I coach football? 
Uh, uh, sleep. Good boy, Mizzle three. Yeah, he knows good way. That look, he wasn't yeah, saying that. Look, he backing off already. Backing <laughs> Just off already. I hope Coach. Let me see Coach Nitch. I'm gonna call Coach Nitch and say, "Don't let you coach no football. You don't yeah. worry about that boys' basketball program." <laughs> nah, he's good people. Right here, couple things on the comments. I have to shout him out, and I and I wanted to do that. I'm glad he reminded me. I make live scores. The Twitter for the conference of the I make. He helped out tremendously um, in getting information on some of these players, putting this list together. Follow him on Twitter at I make live scores. Kyle is a great guy. Um, thank you so much for all the help, not only for this, but throughout the years. I've known him for a while. Uh, he's a big Mooresville guy, but he supports all the teams in the IMAC and does a great job promoting this conference on Twitter. Um, Gabby Bird got a shout out with Sheree. She hung in there and she got the Sheree cameo that everyone deserved. Yeah. Thank you to the Queen of CFI for hanging in with us in the background. And I hope the spider didn't bite you. Uh, no, no. Good, good. Uh, Andre Mason, great work, guys. Thank you, Andre, for staying with us. You know, this was a big, big show. We put a lot of work into this when we have so many kids. You want to highlight that's on the team and, you know, not listed on the team. We want to give them some love. I hope and pray that these guys go back and see this and know that we appreciate all of your hard work that you go into being a high school football player. And, um, you know, that's why we do it. Tim Pride, he's a big follower on Facebook and the Facebook page, CFI Crew. Keep up the good work. I appreciate it. Freaking you. decision. <laughs> that's, the, that's the hashtag this week. That's the hashtag. We got to make a decision, man. We got to make a decision on what we're doing this year. Um, and then, of course, Missile three, McLaren, one of the best coaches I ever dog, had. Man. My dog. Oh, <laughs> oh. He, he ain't never said nothing good about you, Coach Phillips. I know. <laughs> I don't do. I call big on him. He know it. <laughs> I call big on him in a heartbeat. In this. There it is again. That's Make it. a friggin' decision. That's the hashtag. Use it. Use it. Get the word out. We need something to get done here. Um, seriously. But thanks for everyone that came on. Uh, we didn't get this on when Coach Ferb was on. Wanted to get that out there. Money team, Coach Q, had that to say when Coach Ferb was on. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then we had Little John watching, supporting from Mallard Creek. Thank you. Bryce Freeze, we need a decision. That was even before Coach McClamrock's famous hashtag. Um, so everyone's wanting it. Oh, and you see the Dub C highlight? Don't post my Dub C shout up, baby. <laughs> you see it? That's the I, young I boy coming up. I'm so, oh, okay. Self made. Self made. Yes, Dub sir. Self made five. Who is that? Is that a player? I ain't telling you who it is. Shout him out, coach. Come on. No, that's a young boy. He's coming in as a young coach. I don't know his name. Um, for, off base, but I know he's oh, he came from Piedmont. Yeah, I know him. Yeah. Yeah, he's I'm a guy from Piedmont. He's pretty yeah. good. He's, pretty, yeah, he's gonna be pretty good. The blazing thing. Yeah. Yeah, she's he's, gonna be pretty good. Yo, you know, laugh at me. You know I'm terrible. I'm I'm a typical army guy. I'm terrible with la with names. I'm last he's, name only kind of He's a good yeah. player, man. He's gonna be really good. Mizzle three still won't CBI, Charlotte basketball insiders. Yeah. Hey, I'm Mizzle, I got you. Yeah, hey, now, now, hold on, hold on. You get us some sponsors, there will be a CBI, but we oh, need yeah. some sponsors. All right, because, you know, basketball ain't my passion, so I got to get paid. Oh, no, I got you. I can be the hit. You know, press Virginia, baby. That's our full court press. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got kicked out the middle school game, right? Because our full court press, boy, we were whooping that butt by 40, and I kept. <laughs> right up. What is this? No one than 40 minutes of hell? I mean, what, come on. What is that? Hey, man. We full court press. Bob, you're a basketball press player. You don't press up 40. I mean, come on, man. Yes, so, I am. See, that's why you don't play the ball no more. You punch him in the mouth. Oh, Lord. All right. <laughs> three hours and 12 minutes, and you can tell now. So, everybody, thanks for watching. 
um, supporting us at Football Focus Weekly. And seriously, it means a lot. Um, all the great comments and everything from the players, from the coaches, and then you fans with the great comments. And there's still 15 people on. Um, that's incredible. Um, I mean, we're going to cut this up and um, have highlights coming all week long. Um, if you know a kid that was highlighted tonight, please tag them, comment them, reach out to them, text them, let them know. Uh, love to hear the kids hear good stuff about, you know, all the hard work they put into. So, uh, once again, for um, big Kenny McClamrock, make a freaking decision. Um, Coach Billups and then the queen of CFI, Sheree Glenn, this is Matt Morrow. We are signing off, and I'm going to bed because I got to be up at 6 a.m. Actually, 5 a.m. I got to drive to Valentine from Gastonia. All right, anyway, good night, everybody. Appreciate it.